Mr. Pat Dively. Welcome back. It's good to be back. I love your studio. Uh, from a recording standpoint and also therapeutically, it's just it's a nice place to be. Yeah, it's, it's pr- pretty chill, all right. Um, how are you? How are you? How are you doing? Yeah, life is good. Um, life is good. I've been busy with work, um, so been doing my workshops, which you obviously were at one of the recent sessions and. Half of my work doesn't see the light of day in terms of social media. So it's mostly corporate stuff I'm doing at the moment. And uh, outside of that, been training in a way. Um, so lots of training, jiu-jitsu. Uh, yeah, life is good. Staying, yeah. bu- staying busy and feeling on purpose and feeling quite clear at the moment. Brilliant. Check out Pat's Instagram. I haven't seen his uh, transformation pictures <laughs> recently. Look, looking sharp, my man. Cheers. Um, so the last time you were on Pat, we discussed your story and people out there probably know your story so if you don't know Pat's story you can go back and check out the last episode because you covered it in depth gives a lot mm. of context to who you are as a person mm. first of all I want to thank you very much for having me at your base camp event it's the first of those type of events I actually wrote a newsletter on it recently that I've ever been to oh, despite cool. the fact that I'm very interested in this type of work I don't like the group the big group thing but I have to say absolutely fantastic really enjoyed it a lot of takeaways for me a lot of insights into the, the type of person at that event as well I could see reflections of myself and lots of different people who were at lots of different stages in their life. So mm. um, really interesting. And you saying you're busy is a bit of an understatement, I think, because the, the volume of, of value that you're adding to this industry is just insane at the moment. You're doing, I think you said you did 18, 18 talks in the space of a month there. Yeah. Um, which is crazy. And um, the release of your new book, Fit Mind as well, and all that kind of stuff. So congratulations and, and thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you. To jump straight into today's topic, because I mentioned it before we started, I'd like this to be a um, a very usable and relatable episode for people. We're going to talk about archetypes. Yes, indeed. Um, and this was included in your base camp event, but it, it's it's something that I'm very interested in because I have a huge interest in this idea of the, the hero's journey, the stories that we can tell to help ourselves relate. Would you mind explaining to me first, what is an archetype? Yeah. <laughs> I love the first time I came here, you were super excited about the shadow and today it's archetypes and they tie in. So it'll be nice to kind of merge them together. Um. It was Carl Jung that sort of brought the idea of the archetypes to us in the West. Um, he was a Swiss psychologist. Uh, so he would talk about archetypes almost being like universal energies that live within us all. So you go across any culture, any timeline, and maybe you think of the archetype of the mother. It's going to bring certain feelings uh, to the surface for people or certain visual representations. You're going to have a sense of what does the mother represent? Maybe nurturing, maybe, uh, I don't know, care, empathy, compassion. Um, uh, generativity um, and so archetypes are a way I think Carl Jung said if a picture paints a thousand words an archetype is worth a thousand pictures or something like that okay. so it's like a really um, good way of, of uh, understanding different parts of the psyche and so the piece that I work on specifically or kind of work with specifically is the map of the male archetypes so the four key archetypes uh, that were brought about from a book by Moore and Gillette back in 1990 and they brought out this book called King Warrior, Magician, Lover. And what it offered was a bit of a map of the male psyche. So what does, for me, the question is, what does mature masculinity look like? Because we hear a lot about the masculine at the moment and what's working and what's not working. And for me, it's a map. It's like, what does adult psychology look like? What does man psychology look like? Because a lot of the challenges in the world are the result of people being stuck in boy psychology. Um so this is what the archetypes can provide. So universal energies live within us all. Um, one of the ways of uh, that I've heard it talked about, which I liked, was Robert Bly, who was a famous uh, poet in the men's movement, um, talked about how since he was a teenager, I think he said from the neck down to his balls, he had become numb to what was happening in this space. In other words, he'd become completely disconnected from his feelings. It was all like below the waist or in the head. That's where he lived. And a lot of us, I think we, we might be similar. And so he said, having the idea of these archetypes, these different parts living within that space between his neck and his balls, Mm. allowed him to better understand, you know, his emotions. So the archetypes relate to emotions, relate to our behaviors, relate to our beliefs. And um, yeah, it's like these little characters living within us. So each man has got a king within him. He's got a magician, he's got a warrior, and he's got a lover. Okay, Mm. yeah. And this immediately pings me because I'm a big fantasy fan as well. So when I heard these first, I was like, oh, this is really cool. Um, so the male archetypes, mm. are there different female archetypes, first of all, my first question? Yeah, well, in the area of shadow work, the, these archetypes are often used in the context of shadow um, because you're either expressing the archetypes in a healthy, mature way or you're expressing them in shadowy, kind of unconscious ways. 
So a lot of the shadow work people will use the same archetypes, but they'll just put different language on it. So instead of king, they'll say sovereign. So that could be the king or the queen. Okay. And usually they'll stick with warrior. They might say magician or they might say medicine woman. Uh, they might say warrior or huntress. I they, had the sage, the trickster, the hero. All yeah. these other phrases coming up as well. Yeah, and some of these are other archetypes outside of the the, the main four. And um, there's a book uh, for women called or, or about female archetypes called Women Who Run with Wolves. I've not read that, but that's I think Clarissa Pinkett, uh, Caroline Miss does a lot of work around the different archetypes uh, in men and women. An interesting archetype I was looking at the other day was the archetype of the prostitute and how that lives within us all. And so the prostitute archetype within us represents the part of us that does things for money that we don't want to do. Okay. And so in the same way as all the other ar archetypes are useful at certain points and destructive at others, there might be times in my life where I need to do things for money in order to get me through that time in my life because I don't have other, other options. But maybe an unhealthy expression will be spending my whole life in prostitution, giving away my whole life for the purpose of money and sacrificing you know, what I actually want. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, but you mainly focus at the moment on the male, the male mm. archetypes. Yeah. And just as a bit of kind of context for that, I think whether you're male or female, it's very helpful to understand both types of archetypes because yeah. it'll give you a better, a better understanding of the people that you are. Because we all have brothers, sisters, fathers. We're surrounded by men and women. So it's yeah. not just, I am a man, I need to learn about this. It's, it's very useful for everybody. There was a lady who came to a workshop two weeks ago and uh, she obviously couldn't come to the men's workshop, but she came to the mixed workshop the next day and she said her primary purpose for being there was to meet men throughout the day and get not not for any romantic notions yeah. but to understand the male psyche a bit more so she was there to understand the male archetypes i think uh, that is a fantastic mindset to have i it think it's cool. really, really yeah, important it's cool. um okay let's get into it so yeah. let's get into it where would you like to start with the male archetypes maybe to give people just a kind of uh, a, an an overview i suppose of what they might look like um we can start by thinking about the archetypes in their healthy expression so um partially i think about it as not being a one-dimensional man by integrating the four uh, archetypes in a healthy way, I can show up. Um, yeah, I can show up in different ways. So we think about our king as being the part of us ourselves that has vision and structure and a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning that has a sense of the kingdom. So all this is kind of metaphorical in a sense, but you know, my kingdom might be myself and my family, uh, my employees, my social circle. And so a healthy king has a sense of leading his kingdom. You can think about the, the king within you being the leader within you. Um, so that's our king. Vision, purpose, clarity, uh, mission, focus. Um, there's a sense of blessing. This is an important one that like when you're in your healthy king, you see the best in people and you can kind of bless and lift people up because there's not a sense of competition, which would come with some of the shadowy expressions of the king, which we'll talk about. So healthy king, structure and order. The king's not going to do it all by himself. So we might think about, okay, alongside the king within me, there's a warrior. And the warrior is the part of us that, just like any kingdom, there's warriors that will protect the kingdom, that will fight for what's important, that will, you know, for us, our warrior takes action, sets boundaries, um, has a sense of vitality and energy. So if my king is online, my king has a sense of vision. If I've got a healthy warrior, the warrior is able to kind of support the king in that vision. So it's the warrior maybe that gets up and goes to the gym, whereas it's the king that has the vision of the six pack or whatever it might be. So that's our, our warrior. Uh, the magician then is like the thinking part. So we've got our uh, king who leads. We've got our warrior who acts or protects. And then we've got our magician who thinks um, so the magician is kind of strategic, gets down in the detail. Um, you know, uh, we can think about this, obviously, these archetypes being within us. We all have all four, but you can think in a bigger sense that some of us lean toward one more than the other. So within a company, the king might be the visionary and then the magician might be the kind of, um, what's the word, engineer, like the details person in the background that helps make the vision a reality. So our magician is about planning, strategy, um, acquiring more knowledge. You know, if your king decided they wanted this podcast studio, your warrior needed to come in and get the place set up and needed to save the money and needed, to, your magician needed to step away and say, well, okay, what kind of equipment is best to get here? Okay, how, how do we record? You, that's the thinking part it's about technology and acquiring new information that can support the vision because we can't transform without new insight. And then finally, the lover is the part of us that's connected to feeling and to emotion and to connection. So the lover connects, we can connect to our emotions. If we've got a healthy lover online, we can connect to our loved ones, connect to nature, connect to music, enjoy the present moment, enjoy the journey. So the first three, king, warrior, magician, are kind of about like, where are we going here? 
And if they're very strong, but we don't have a healthy lover online, you might see that you struggle with enjoying the journey. You're always trying to get somewhere else. Um, you're never content. Uh, you've got that restlessness within you. So a healthy system uh, kind of takes all four into account. We might think about that as the balanced, healthy expression of the archetype. And then for each of the four, you'll have two shadowy, uh, what's the word? Immature expressions, maybe. Yeah, you explained it quite nicely in the event with the triangle and the line down the middle of mm. the balance. And if you're too far to one corner, um, it's your health, oh, but a health expression too far to the other corner. Actually, the health expression is in the middle. Healthy expression is in the middle. So that kind of comes straight from that book. Uh, yeah, if you think about a, a triangle down on the left hand side, you've got inflated. Sorry, that was it. Yeah. And on the left hand side, deflated or the other way around. But an inflated energy would be, say, uh, take the warrior, for example, the inflated warrior is maybe very good at being in that warrior energy, but spends their whole life there. And yeah. so is a little bit impatient or a little bit ruthless and uh, doesn't think about other people's needs. So that's, a, that's someone who's kind of over identified with the warrior. And someone who's under identified with the warrior could be someone who's a pushover or a people pleaser. Uh, struggles to speak up for themselves, struggles to look after their needs. So those are kind of, you can start to see, okay, my warrior has always been expressed in different ways. And as you start to see the unhealthy expressions, you can kind of bring yourself back to center, hopefully, and develop that healthy aspect. Yeah. I made the, I was incorrect in my assumption at the start when I heard about the archetype that I, you pick an archetype or one, one of these represents you. But as you said, maybe you'll tend to lean more at certain periods in your life into one but what's really empowering for me is learning that they're all within us mm. so if I feel if I'm a person who feels maybe I'm a bit more reserved and I don't feel like I have that energy and that drive and go it's definitely within me I just mm. have to figure out why it's I'm, I don't have that healthy balance maybe it's in the shadow maybe I haven't acknowledged it yet and brought it forth but that's in all of us and for me that was when I got really excited it's like okay this is pretty cool now because now I have all these different elements within me that mm. I can tap into and I think as a a, a kind of a vessel or a vehicle for understanding my own feelings and emotions that for me is much easier because mm. I can visualize it now mm. and now I can actually go in and call on these different characters but I'm really just accessing my own emotions and parts of my identity so that's what really excited me about the, the whole thing um, Yeah and on that you, you mentioned emotion and emotion is there's, there's the idea of the gateway emotion for each of the archetypes so the last podcast we did together, we talked about the shadow, the idea that we push certain parts of ourselves away. Um, the, the Each of the, these, these archetypes will have a primary emotion and we can kind of see the primary emotion as pointing us to the, um, give you an example, um, the primary emotion related to the warrior is anger. And so if I experience anger in my life and anger could look like lots of different things, it could be on a mild level, it could be frustration. And if I don't deal with my frustrations, it generally becomes anger over time. And if I don't deal with my anger, oftentimes it turns to rage. So when I notice frustrations in my life or I notice agitation in my life, usually it's pointing me to the need to be more of my healthy warrior. So if I find myself being a people pleaser, I'm not expressing my anger. I'm not saying that's not okay with me. And so there's a call for me to step into my clean communication, clean language. So anger relates to the warrior. Uh, with the lover, the gateway emotion oftentimes is grief. And when we don't allow ourselves to cry or to feel the difficult feelings, generally we numb ourselves to all of our emotions. And so sometimes we need to cry and that's our access to, you know, the man who feels numb in life maybe needs a good cry. And once it's like he un unlocks that part of himself, that lover archetype. Uh, the king is joy. So, you know, when we experience joy in our lives, that can point us toward what's meaningful to us, what means a lot to us. And the difference between joy and happiness, you might think about happiness as being somewhat circumstantial. You know, I'm happy when my podcast gets lots of downloads, but when it doesn't, I don't feel happy. Whereas joy is, life is challenging. There's some stuff that, that is difficult, but I feel I'm on purpose. I feel I'm, I'm in meaning. And then finally, uh, for the magician, fear is usually the gateway. So when I meet fear, it offers an opportunity to step into my healthy magician, to take a step back, to find perspective and think about transformation because the magician is all about transformation. So... You've got your, again, back to our friend that we said had no uh, idea what he was feeling or what those feelings pointed to. Our warrior relates to anger. Our lover relates to grief and the willingness to let go because grief and love stay together. You'll only grieve what you love. Um, magician is fear and then um, king is joy. Okay. 
Okay, that's amazing. There's a lifetime of work in the archetypes and I'm, I'm st- I still consider myself a novice with this stuff. So well, I'm a novice, so whatever the next step <laughs> up for novice is, is sitting across from me here. Blue belt. <laughs> Blue belt. If we're to go a little bit deeper then into each individual one and maybe look at what the he- a healthy and unhealthy expression of that archetype yeah. would be. So if we start with uh, warrior, um, so we can think about it um, again, the healthy expression of the warrior is the man who... Or, or woman, uh, depending on the language we use in, in, in terms of the, the archetypes. But the healthy expression is about, I'm able to get up and take action on the things that are important to me. In other words, I'm able to uh, create my king's vision. Uh, I'm able to set boundaries and protect um, what's important to me. So if sobriety is important to me, my healthy warrior is the part of me that says, no, I don't drink anymore. So it's about protection, about taking action. A lot of it's about vitality. So having the energy and having the physical capacity to go and make things happen in the world. So that would kind of come into warrior as well. Um, for each of the archetypes, we will generally have taken on wounding messages as boys. So we'll have, we'll have taken on certain messages that led us to believe that there's something wrong with us. And that's where the shadow appears. So again, we talked about it on the last episode that when we come into the world, we show all of ourselves. And then when we are told we're not enough or we don't fit in or there's something wrong with us, we start hiding parts of ourselves. So uh, for many of us as boys, we took on the belief that I don't matter or I don't exist. So this is the wound of the warrior. So if you think about coming into the world, pure expression, you take on for whatever reason, the belief that you don't matter or you don't exist. Generally, there's two ways you respond to that. One way is you you kind of give up. You're like, yeah, I, I just don't matter. I don't exist. And I don't matter, don't exist could be that your your father never spent time with you uh, and, and you took on the message, it's because I don't matter or I don't exist. It could be that your parents uh, over-parented you and you never got to make your own decisions. So there's a sense of, oh, I'm just an extension of my parents. I'm not my own person. So this, is, this sense of, I don't matter. I, I, I'm not my own unique expression. And so there's two ways you respond. You either kind of give up and you say, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't matter. And this is the nice guy or the, or the people pleaser who, hey, Pat, where do you want to go for lunch? Oh, whatever you want. I, 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 I say I'm easy, but in reality, what I'm saying is I don't matter. I don't exist. So whatever you want to do is good for me. So that's one expression, one unhealthy expression. And then the flip side of the coin is the person who believes they don't matter and they don't exist. But rather than kind of giving up, they say, I'm going to show you how much I matter. And they use, they try to hold power over other people in some ways. Um, or, or that's the man who doesn't care about other people's needs. He's like relentless. So that can look like being a bit of a bully, being impatient with other people. Um, uh, what else can it be? Overworking, uh, always trying to achieve, always in a state of doing. So those are kind of the two extremes, the bully and the nice guy. And you might notice in certain aspects of your life, you're the bully. So you're just like cracking the whip at home and you're like, okay, my way or the highway. You know, we're eating what I want to eat for dinner. And the family's not getting a say in this. And then maybe in the workplace, I'm the nice guy. And my boss says, hey, I know you're going to take a holiday with your family this weekend, but I've got a work project, so I'm going to need you to do this. Oh, no problem, no problem. So these are two unhealthy expressions. And these just point us back to, okay, I need to come back to center. And then we can start to think about, right, how do I develop my healthy warrior, develop that part of me that is clear and concise. Um, does that make sense? Is it, it? Not only does it make sense, it speaks really, you mentioned this in, in your event as well, it speaks really, really closely to me. I recognize that in myself as well. So when you said, when you started to speak about this in myself, first of all, you spoke about the, the yes man and the person who is kind of believed they don't e- exist and really embodies that. And I was like, that's me. But then you also mentioned in the, the other side and I was like, oh, maybe that's me. Yeah. But you can... I'm pendulum between the you're two. Pendulum. Yeah. And you're pendulum back and forth past what balance should be, which is somewhere in the middle with that healthy expression. And that that is exactly and I, I've been aware of that for quite a few years now, but never really understood why. Mm. It's like, is this just who I am? This need sometimes to please people because it's it's an an, an, an inadequacy in myself. Yeah. But that makes perfect, perfect sense to me. Um, and I'm sure there's many people listening now as well. And I think I'm gonna make this comment now, and I think I think I'm gonna make it again when we discuss this with the king. I see a lot of that nowadays with this um, lost feeling among men, mm. this purposelessness maybe, and maybe that's to do more with the king, the vision and, and stuff like that, but also this feeling of less than. Mm. Um, I, I mentioned before on, on a podcast, I've uh, attended some psilocybin ceremonies. The big thing that kept coming up for me is not being enough. Mm. And the big thing I wanted to work on was being enough, feeling like I am enough, you are enough. And this was a lot of messaging for me around you are enough. And it's really helped me. Cool that self-talk to myself mm. but that's shown me that there was a deficiency there before and where did that come from because I look at my life and my parents and everything I can't 
identify where it might have come from. Mm. But as you said, it could be really subtle. It could be really, really subtle or something that I interpreted incorrectly and internalized yeah. as opposed to something that was actually done to me. And um, so that that's really fascinating. That speaks a lot to me that uh, that less than kind of feeling that not enough. Yeah, and the, the I'm not enough is actually the wound of the king, which we'll probably come to. Okay. Um, but just to round out maybe the warrior with... Um, or unseen, it, yeah, feeling unseen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With warrior, I don't exist, I don't matter, I'm you know, unseen, yeah. Um, one, the bully is kind of the idea, my needs matter, yours don't. Yeah. And the nice guy is the idea, Your my needs, needs matter, matter yeah. yours do. Yeah. And then the healthy warrior is kind of a sense of, yeah, healthy warrior fights for the greater good of all. So... Uh, another way of thinking about it, we talk about anger. Um, sometimes people think anger is a bad thing, anger is wrong. The healthy warrior expresses clean anger. And the way I decipher his clean anger is anger with heart, like anger with heart. So if you do something that upsets me, I'm able to express that to you and use my anger to express what's going on for me and how it hurt and how it's not okay for you to show up in that way. But I've got heart in there, which means I'm not trying to tear you apart. I'm not trying to tear you down. And that's different to aggression or, or unclean anger where I'm trying to destroy. Like yeah. the, the shadowy aspects of the warrior is about destruction, whereas the healthy aspect is about protection. Um, and one, one final kind of uh, piece you can think about is uh, some of the gold for the warrior is the decisiveness. I get things done. I'm quick to act. I create results in the world. I'm a go-getter. But the shadow that often shows up for a lot of us is impatience. So... I'm impatient, I lack empathy, I lack compassion, I expect everyone to work at the same pace that I do. Uh, I'm kind of competitive, um, so that's kind of the Achilles heel, I guess. So really embrace your warrior, be happy with the decisiveness, it's great to have the decisiveness, but just keep an eye on that other piece. So if we go out, go to a restaurant and you're a healthy, you know, you, if you're very warrior-esque, you might pick what you're gonna have for food within seconds. Yeah. And then there's someone else at the table who's more in their lover and they're slow and they're different, and you get frustrated with them, so it's, yeah, just noticing these patterns. Yeah, I think you mentioned before as well, possibly on the last podcast, this idea of um, somebody stepping into your space and most of us will allow people to come closer than we're actually comfortable with mm. to avoid confrontation. Mm. But then we will express resentment or yeah. more anger than we probably should have uh, with, with that. Um, and like we, we've allowed people to encroach on us, but then have allowed ourselves to get angry at that encroachment that we allowed in the first place. So it's a constant cycle with ourselves. Well, my pattern continuously, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> like I'm still working on it, but it's to let the small things slide that frustrate me or irritate me in relationship or in working relationship or whatever it might be. Being that nice guy who doesn't express like, and I'll come up with, we always, I think we come up with a million reasons. If it's early on in dating with someone, I'll be like, oh, it's too early to express what I actually want. But yeah. then it's crazy. It's like, you're just setting the context then to lie and to manipulate and to pretend everything's okay when it's not. Yeah. So it's like, well, I think we'll always find a reason to say, oh, that's why I'm not going to speak up for myself. But um, as I mentioned earlier, I think your frustrations over time build to anger. So the frustration of one of your colleagues showing up for work every minutes for every, every day for 10 minutes late, you can let it slide, let it slide, let it slide. Eventually there's going to be boom. Yeah, boom. Yeah. 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 Do you know, it's funny when I was driving to pick up this morning, I was actually thinking in my head, I'd heard you speak like this before. And I was like, if Pat says something to me to establish a boundary for himself, don't get triggered. Because I would get triggered by something like that. I was okay. like, what? What's the fucking problem with me? I, I didn't even do it in that part. But I was like, that's just him expressing his clean anger and setting a boundary. And you didn't, obviously. <laughs> Maybe I didn't do it to annoy you. But I was like, I was prepping myself on the way. Because very few people would establish their boundaries with you. Mm. And when they do, oftentimes they're then angry. So it's a challenge to you. And then we respond to that challenge. And that's why, I mean, I'm of the opinion that 99% of the arguments we have nowadays can be avoided with our own work on ourselves because we're just responding to what we interpret as an attack from another person, but mm. it's actually defensive from the other person. So I was actually mentally prepping myself. I was like, if Pat establishes <laughs> a boundary here today, that's okay. And you should establish some boundaries. I have had, um, I've had it recently where, you know, I've expressed with one or two people like where I'm at and there's been a fear of losing those people and I've lost those people. Really? Yeah, and it's not that I'm going around like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, it, but it has been a conscious effort on my part recently to kind of say, look, I need to get a bit better on this. I'm too relaxed. I'm not too relaxed, but I'm too, it's shadowy again. Like it is shadowy to, to say, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But then to be pissed off at someone behind their back for something they don't even realize they've done. Have you noticed yourself doing that a lot? Uh, it's it, it's been a pattern over the years where I feel sometimes taken advantage of or okay, feel like, yeah. oh, people only show up when they need something or whatever it is. But I don't say anything. I keep my mouth 
uh, cut yeah. and then I can get kind of ruthless and be like, ah, oh, I'm done with that person. So recently I tried to like have the conversation with two people and just say, look, I, I sort of, you know, I notice you only contact me when you need something and I find that hurtful. Uh, I don't know how it is for you and they've disappeared, you know, so. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I found it really stark in business. It's a big thing in business um, to my disadvantage for years being o- overly afraid of because you attach everything to the business, your livelihood, your entire life, my whole identity. If I don't keep this person happy, but then a lot of people take advantage and then you resent the people taking advantage, but you created the situation. So I can, I can see why people in business, well, all these stats about businesses that fail, I can see it's a lot to do with the, the, the person in the business, not the business itself or the economy or the marketing or the sales. It's you and yeah. all the shadowy stuff that's going on in there. Yeah, I've had that where like a company will say, oh, will you come and speak? And I'll give my fee and they'll say, will you do it for less? And I'll agree. <laughs> And then oh, I'll go in. I'll go into it with a kind of sh- not a shitty attitude, but I'll go in feeling a little bit hard done by. Yeah. Even though I agree to it, so it's like, yeah. Again, this is why we say anger is the gateway emotion because those little frustrations can point us to where we're out of integrity, either yes. with ourselves or with others. And out of integrity means you're not doing what you said you'd do. Yeah, and this phrase, which only lately is really making sense to me, not living in line with your values. Mm. Because one, I didn't know my values. And now that I know my values, I'm starting to see areas in my life where I'm not in line. I'm like, that's painful. That's, I'm feeling, that's a, there's friction there for me now. And I can never, I'm aware of the friction. Whereas before I wasn't aware, it was still there, but I wasn't aware. But now I'm aware of it. I'm like, fuck, that's painful. Yeah. Got to figure out what the fuck that thing is. Yeah. And if someone threatens your values in any capacity, if the, this is generally where anger comes from is, you know, if I have a value on adventure and that's something I love. Yeah. And I start a relationship and all is good. And then after a couple of months, I feel in any capacity that my value of adventure is being threatened. That's going to elicit some anger in me. So yeah, our, 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 the values piece is really important again, actually, for the warrior. Because the warrior is not so much uh, going to act on how he feels. You can think of Dave, Gog- Dave Goggins maybe as, a, as an example of a um, someone who's very warrior. Yeah. Fuck your feelings, all yeah, that kind yeah, of stuff, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, and you actually mentioned, because it's a nice proxy for that, you mentioned um, when we spoke before that you can use David Goggins when you need David Goggins. Mm. And I find, I've had conversations with many people who are, and again, it's tribal nowadays, but I, I, I love Goggins and I hate Goggins. Sure. It's like, why, why do we love or hate Goggins? Use the Goggins when you need the Goggins and then yeah. use the compassion and all that when you need that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's an interesting example of that. And maybe taking him as an example, um, I don't know what he's like in his personal life, but obviously he's very strong in the warrior and it's kind of go, 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 go. Uh, We start by talking about the warrior because for a lot of men, that's the one that comes most natural, maybe the idea of doing, getting things done, being strong, being brave, whatever it might be, all those things that a warrior represents. But if we think about a soldier who fights battles all day and doesn't have uh, the capacity to shift gears when they get home in the evening and be with their family, that's a one-dimensional man or one-dimensional woman, uh, depending on who the soldier is. And so um, this is where it, it's useful to be able to go beyond the warrior. Because again, for a lot of us men, warrior is all we know or all we've seen. We don't maybe recognize there's another part of me that's a lover, another part magician, another part king. Yeah. So that might segue us to lover potentially, would it? It might. A question I want to ask mm. you, do you want to maybe talk about some ways of restoring that balance now? Or do you want to cover all the archetypes and then come back and maybe talk about some practical... I can share, um, I can share a couple of ideas for warrior. Yeah. Um, first thing is values. So you brought that up. Knowing your values is key. Um, because your warrior just wants to take action, just wants to get things done. It's not a thinking part. It's not an emotive part. It's just going to follow instructions. So what are the instructions you follow? That's kind of your values. Okay. Does that come from you or from the king? Uh, that's somewhat, somewhat kingly. Um, but I think it's good for the warrior to really have an awareness around like what, what you value. So just think about, you know, what do you want other people to say about you when you're not around? He's kind, he's compassionate, he's curious. What do you want people to say about you at your funeral? He was uh, someone who cared about community. He was someone that made an impact in the world. He was someone that looked after his family. Uh, who are you when you're at your best? I'm creative. I'm enthusiastic. I'm outgoing. So just answer some of these questions. And pick the words that really jump out to you. And those might be your values. And, you know, I shared in a recent seminar that if I have a value on compassion, every time I act compassionately, it's like I'm putting money in that bank account. And I develop self-esteem because I'm investing in something that's important to me. And every time I act from the opposite place, I act from judgment rather than compassion, I'm withdrawing from the bank account. 
So if you're someone who's struggling with a healthy sense of self, struggling with confidence, struggling with self-esteem, there's a strong possibility you haven't invested in the things that you value. And if you're willing to start doing those things daily, it can make an impact. So that would be piece one, look at values. Uh, piece two will be look at where do you need boundaries? So boundaries could be where are the places in your life where these values are compromised. So if I value health and I'm drinking too much, I need a boundary around my alcohol intake. If I value compassion and I'm bitching about people and gossiping about people to my friends, I need a boundary around that. If I value uh, peace of mind and myself and my partner just are always in chaos, maybe I need a boundary with my partner, my friend, whoever it might be. So your values will inform your boundaries to a certain degree. Yeah. And your actions then should be informed by your values. So I say, I would say, tell people one of my values is being a compassionate person with myself and others. There's loads of times where I don't want to be compassionate with, with anyone, <laughs> myself or others. So if someone leaves a shitty comment on my social media, there's a part of me that wants to go for them and attack them. But I remember, I remind myself of who I want to be and, and that's important. So values, boundaries, actions, and then your other piece you might consider just with the, the warrior is to think about your vessel. So like warrior is related to your vitality, your energy, your capacity to go and make things happen in the world. You could have a very clear sense of your vision in life, but if you don't have energy to get up and do things, you're going to struggle. So whatever health is to you, I think that would be the other focus I would look at. Oh, I love that, man. That's such a lovely a lovely uh, roundup of those points. Um, an interesting exercise that Brian Lockle introduced me to was the, this idea of the eulogy, your funeral. Yes. Write what you think people would say about you now and then write what you think what you would like people to say about you. And I'm like, whoa, they are different, yeah. man. That's not how I'm living at the moment. So that brings it to the forefront of your awareness. Yeah. Uh, very, very useful uh, exercise there. Well, one final piece that I, I don't know if I brought this up the last time I was here, but the idea of shadow values, maybe I did. Um, everyone's good on knowing their value. No, not everyone's good. A lot of people are aware of their values. So value, compassion, playfulness, and adventure. And uh, that's one side of the coin. But if you can name your shadow values, so just go for the opposite. So the opposite of playfulness maybe is... Um, serious. Uh, the opposite of adventure is monotony and the opposite of compassionate is judgment. Um, it's good to be aware of those as well because they inform where you're tripping yourself up. Uh, it's all well and good focusing on the man you want to be, but it's also useful to be aware of, okay, who are you when you're not at your best? Yeah, That can be useful. I read something recently. It was very bro, bro psychology now. Um, it was on a podcast or something. And this It was a, a new coined concept of an alien's eye view. So imagine a bird's eye view. Yes. If an alien came down, Rogan talks about this a lot actually as yeah. well. If an alien came down and looked at you, I think he talks about it in terms of society, like what would they make a society? Yeah. But if an alien came down and looked at you, all they would see is what you're doing and how you're living your life. Mm. They can't understand your language. They can't read your thoughts. So the things you tell yourself and the things you're doing, there's a disconnect there for many of us. Uh, and if an alien came down and looked and saw what you were doing, that is who that type of person is. Pat is a compassionate person yeah. and he speaks and helps these people and he, he, he does these things. But sometimes in his life, he does these things. Yes. And if you could imagine that, yeah. you'd be like, okay, that's a and almost an impartial way of viewing yourself. What am I actually doing objectively? Mm. And then you have your exercise done in terms of what your values are. And you can kind of, well, okay, where, where are the misalignments here? That's where the work needs to be done. Nice. Um, I find that that simple concept very kind of cool. Nice. What would somebody who didn't know me or someone from a different planet think if they saw how I live my life? Because I am biased. And mm. I'm going to tell myself that I'm a good person and I am compassionate, but do I live my life that way? Mm. Um, and the best thing to do for that is get into a relationship and then you'll be, <laughs> be challenged every day if you're living in line with your values and the things you say in a podcast. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. La the last piece maybe on Warrior that, um, that could be useful is integrity is an important word, as you say, like uh, are my are my actions me matching my 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 values or my, my thoughts? Uh, you could literally just pick one thing to focus on for the next seven days and every day in the evening write down, did I do the thing? Yeah. Yes. And if no, why not? And you can just learn from that. So for the next seven days to develop my warrior, I'm going to go and walk 10,000 steps a day. Did I do it? Yes. Okay. Tuesday, did I do it? Yes. Wednesday, did I do it? No. Why not? Uh, left it till too late in the day and the weather was kind of bad. Okay. Learn something from that. Thursday, did I do it? Yes. So that can be a, another way of kind of developing that aspect. Make a clear, deliverable um, target and, yeah. and meet it or don't. What is that? We will segue eventually. <laughs> what is that? really hard resistance that we feel. For example, I heard um, maybe with Peterson or someone talk about lying before to live an, a life of integrity. Don't tell any lies. Mm. Don't tell lies. And I was like, I'm going to try this for a while. I realized how many lies I tell in my life. Yeah. Small white lies, not like I'm not lying about everything, but little white lies to 
grease the groove for my life. Sure. So just to make things easier on myself, I tell little white lies to not have to deal with certain things. As soon as I change that, I think I might have used this example before. For example, if I was delayed with a project for a client, easy for me to say, didn't get your email. Oh, I had a the technology didn't work, something broke down. But now I don't. So now it's forcing me to become better and not, not have the project late because if I do, I'm going to have to go through that painful experience. Mm. But that moment where I have to decide between lying and not lying, I know what I want to do. I know what my values are. It's so difficult. Why Why is that so difficult? Why is it just so much friction there for me? I want to be a good person. I believe I'm a good person. But this lie would make me feel just oh, better for, for a while. <laughs> Temporary relief. Distraction yeah. from my shadow, maybe. Yeah, probably. Um, well, we all fear judgment, I suppose. So it's like, yeah, we have all these weird ways of... I read a book called Existential Kink. It's about shadow. It's, it's really <laughs> Sounds weird. like a funky band from the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really, really great book. But she talks about like how we've all these weird different parts of ourselves. So say you're broke and you want to make money. She like has you consider maybe there's a part of you that loves being broke and really gets off on being broke. And it's kind of an interesting. That's a very thing. popular topic of discussion nowadays. Is it? Yeah, you just love being poor. There's a lot of business coaches. I don't know how they're broaching that topic in the, yeah. the, a compassionate way. Yeah. But a lot of them are saying now, if you're poor, you just like being poor. It's That's second. probably like tough love kind of stuff. It is tough but, love, yeah. But her thing is like, I found it interesting. She's got this one exercise, bit of a segue, but it's called the deepest fear inventory. And so you think about something you'd love to achieve in the next 12 months. I'd like to start an intimate relationship. And then at the top of the page, you write, I refuse to start an intimate relationship because I'm terrified that, and you just write for 10 minutes and you just see what comes up and all your unconscious fears come up. You just keep the pen moving. Don't think I'm terrified. I'll lose my freedom. I will uh, lose my sense of autonomy. I will not be enough. She'll cheat on me. She'll leave. Uh, da -da 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 -da. I have mine in here. I'm not going to read it. <laughs> mine's in here. Oh, did you do it? I did it. But what's really interesting about that is you kind of start to see, oh, okay, there's a part of me that's really excited by the idea of a relationship. There's a 10 other parts that are terrified of the thought. So, yeah, it's, I think it's always self-preservation. It's like, how do I keep myself safe? So the the little white eyes, I'm the same. Like, I remember I I put, gave money to um, someone in Nepal to build a school uh, a couple of years ago, like $28,000 to build a school. Uh. And um, I used to do every year for my birthday, like 28th birthday, raise 28,000, give it to someone, 29,000, my twin. And I remember, you know, I'd be doing a talk and I'd be talking about, you know, I've raised a quarter of a million for local charities. I've built schools in Nepal. There's like one school. I'm like, why am I missing school? Uh, yeah. like, what's the fucking point? <laughs> why am I saying schools? So yeah, I have the same thing. I have to catch myself. Don't it's let like, the truth get in the way of a good story. That's what they say. Yeah, yeah. but I think it's good. Ex it is a good exercise. It, it forces you to level up. It mm. does to avoid avoid doing the things that you would have to lie about mm. um, or over elaborating because of some sense of insecurity within yourself. Like mm. not one school, multiple schools. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's a funny thing and again the ego comes in there won't get sidetracked by that and mm. um, that's a, a a beautiful description of the warrior mm. let us segue to the, the big man with the crown on his head okay we're going to king uh, yeah oh sorry did you want to go no no king actually makes sense because okay. a note when we think about king and magician or sorry king and warrior so if I don't have a sense of vision if I don't have the healthy king so the healthy king again is vision structure sense of what my life looks like, what I'd like it to look like, who's important in my life, what's important in my life, who do I want to be? If I don't have that sense, you could think about it that now your warrior is just kind of running around life as a mercenary, like tr chopping people up or like just reckless, staying busy for the sake of busy or just exhausted and just, oh, I have no one to lead me here. Like I'm kind of lost. So again, it's thinking about these different parts of ourselves. So healthy king, um, Ultimately, the, the wound for the king is as young men, we take on the idea that I'm not enough. So it's different uh, to some of the other wounds. I'm not enough. Um, so, you know, you could take that on. You, you miss a penalty playing football. You, I'm not enough. You ask a girl out. She says, no, I'm not enough. You, whatever it is, um, you've got different interests. Your friends, I'm not enough. And your response to I'm not enough is kind of similar. You can either kind of believe it and just give up. And this becomes one shadow form of the king, the weakling. That's the man that gives his power away, looks to the government to have all the answers, looks to, he looks, looks upward and thinks this king's coming to save him. You're getting political. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know anything about politics. <laughs> and then the other side is the tyrant. So that's the man who believes he's not enough, but he's going to desperately show you he's, and again, if we think about politics, some of the biggest political leaders in the world in recent years are tyrannical. They, uh, 
they want power over others. That's where they get their power. So the healthy king finds his power in his sense of self, his sense of vision, his sense of structure, his sense of purpose, his sense of who he is, believes he is enough, and that's where his power comes from. And then the two uh, the shadowy elements are the weakling who gives his power away and you know gives it to the media, gives it to someone else, wants a father figure, like even though you're a grown man, wants a father figure to point you in the direction of what you should be doing in life. And then the tyrant is the one who holds power over others. So again, you might be a weakling in your place of work where you're always waiting for someone else to come and fix things. You're always waiting for someone else to tell you exactly what you should be doing. You're waiting for someone to come and save you. It could be your weakling coming out. And then maybe at home you're the tyrant and you don't take into account anyone else's needs or desires in the family. You just, uh, you're tyrannical in your, your leadership. You don't allow your kids to express themselves in the way they want to express. You are tyrannical as to how they should be in the world. Or it could be the opposite way around. So when we notice these expressions of ourselves, I just think about it as um, when I'm gossiping or bitching about people, um, that's one sign yes. of me trying to be powerful over other, someone else. Undermining like, someone to steal their power. Yeah. yeah. Or when I'm putting people on pedestals and I'm kind of feeling like less than, I mean, it's caught in comparison. These can be kind of signs of, of, of that losing my center. And so I want to be coming back to center, that sense of I am enough. Um, that's that's the king for me. Again, I reckon so. It's, I'm going to say this on every one of these, but I recognize this within myself. But I also really recognize this within the greatest society at the moment, just the way things are structured. And again, I'm not going to drag it down with politics and culture. Don't worry. <laughs> I but don't know enough about ju politics. Just as an observation, when you know people, and people are essentially politics. Mm. If you look at the way, take the 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 father, mm. who has an average job, a normal job, an office job, and he's within a system, and the system is top down. So he is going to be suppressed by some form of that system. So that's going to force him potentially or trigger him or facilitate him to lose that balance of a healthy king. So you mentioned he might come home and be tyrannical with his children. He mm. might be tyrannical with his underlings in the job. He might not be a good boss. He might be, they said, bullshit rolls downhill. He, he might just be passing that negative emotion on and that's fueling his unhealthy king. Mm. And that's everywhere. And that is why there's so much nuance and complexity to discussing these topics because it's not like we live in a vacuum that's a perfect neutral environment sure. where we just have all the time and space to try and slowly stop that pendulum swinging and come back to center with everything. Sure. Every day we're dealing with just this bullshit yeah. that's knocking the pendulum out. So it's it's even more important that we can become aware of this because mm. no matter no matter if you change nothing about your life circumstances, mm. changing how you can interpret them and respond to them, can maybe give you the space yourself within that madness to, to come back to center and then you, you live a better life. Um, I talked about this in the context of struggle recently again, but it's this, it's the, this per perception you have and awareness you have of how you interact with the challenges. That's the big difference, not necessarily the challenges themselves because we'll, we'll always have challenges. We're, we're, not everybody can quit their job and go live a life of free and easy kind of self-discovery, but there's space to do that within a lot of our existing life so i think that's for me when you're speaking there I, I can almost see that picture playing out that story playing out over and over and over with me personally mm. and with many other people that i know mm. uh, men and women yeah it's very interesting a, a big challenge they talk about with the king is um the lack of role models that we have oh yeah so if you look out into the world you're like who represents the king out there. <laughs> yeah um well we've seen a lot of that with the young guys like i know guys nice young guys that are are like really switched on you know really um proactively looking after, you know, going into personal development and all that. And they're looking to some of these manosphere guys or whatever. Yeah. And they're just parroting. Like, it's not interesting to me to talk to these young guys about certain issues because they're just parroting what they hear Andrew Tay talk about or what they hear any of these ma manosphere, like, oh, women are this, and you know. And it's, um, I don't know, I think that's the same thing. That's the weakling projecting your stuff onto other people by own, instead of owning your own power or blaming other people. Yeah. Like, I think the healthy king takes responsibility. This is my life and, um, you know, there's challenges, but I'm going to step into the challenge. We don't see, if you go back a couple of generations, people like maybe Mandela would have represented a king, like someone who was seen as someone who was quite balanced, had done their work. I'm sure, again, he'd have his detra detractors or whatever. But at the moment, because as you say, things are so polarized in many ways, people are black or white, they're good or bad, right or wrong. Yeah. That's an important, you know, in, ter in terms of integrating the healthy king. A part of it is owning your shadow. So it's 
Um, we talked about this on the last podcast, the idea that like political figures should, should go and do ayahuasca before they start leading other people and they should integrate their own. They should do know, base camp. That's what they should. <laughs> they should do base camp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, another, for me, an interesting one on the King is, 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 um, it's, I guess somewhat related to father energy and the father wound that like for many of us, we wouldn't have got the, wouldn't have got the approval from our fathers that we would have hoped for. There's something very nourishing for a man to be told by an older man that you're doing a good job, that you're enough, that you're, you're talented, whatever it might be. Like that blessing is really, this is a key aspect of the King is being, being, blessing someone else. Like there's a real, if I feel okay in myself and I'm fully integrated or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing my work. I can look you in the eyes and say, you do an amazing job of what you do. And I really appreciate what you bring to the world. And that's nourishing for someone else, particularly when it comes from an older man. And um, because for many of us, we didn't get it from our fathers, not because they didn't want to, but because it was a different generation. Maybe they didn't know how to communicate effectively. Maybe they didn't know how to be vulnerable. Maybe they grew up in a generation where you had to work all the time and your only value was in the work that you brought to the world. And so if you weren't working, you weren't of value, there wasn't time for emotion, all this kind of stuff. This has been a knock-on effect with this lack of blessing. And um, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I think that's an important piece. I'm going to use myself again as an example here. Mm. Super slow to praise for such a long time. Mm. And it's only recently I'm recognizing that myself really slow to offer praise to anybody else because I almost viewed it as detracting from my own value if I was to offer value to someone else. Yeah, yeah. Um, I made a shared before I was, <laughs> I was in a... Um, a Wachuma, so plant medicine ceremony, Wachuma, San Pedro. And okay. uh, it's a long day. It's like, I don't know, eight, eight nine, 10 hours probably in the medicine. So you, you, you take the medicine in the morning and then you're kind of into your shadows for the day. And the big thing that came up for me was like all these points throughout my life where I felt I couldn't trust men, uh, where I felt um, lonely, I felt isolated, all of these memories from childhood felt like the new guy. We moved around a lot. So I was always the new guy. I wasn't good at sport, didn't fit in. And ultimately what it showed me was how much of my life had become a competition. Because if I don't trust other men, then I need to, need to compete with other men. And then I cried and I cried and I cried because I was like, Jesus, I always saw everything as a competition. I'd see people in my industry as competition. I'd see people that are trying to support me as competition. I, I just, <laughs> it was interesting to me because I cried and I cried and I cried. And in that moment, I was like, oh, I'm going to organize another retreat like this and bring like all loads of facilitators from around Ireland, like, cause they're not my competition. They're my friends. And we, we ultimately went and organized that. But the following year I went into similar stuff and I'm crying and I'm crying and I'm crying. And the first year the shaman had come and held my head and like, you know, which is like, a, I felt like a child that was being uh, cared for by their mother. And it was really nice. She, she held my head and held my hand and all this kind of stuff. The following year I'm crying and crying and crying again. And I see her walking toward me and I'm like, oh, she's going to come and hold my head again. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> and she comes over and she looked at me and she goes, when are you going to stop being a victim? <laughs> I was like, Jesus Christ. I was like, Oof. and it's, Ouch. it stopped me in my tracks. And I was like, wow. And what I realized in that moment was like, you could cry for your wounds for the rest of your life. And it's important to give some space and to be compassionate with yourself and to like, let some tears go for like stuff you've struggled with or whatever, but you could get stuck in that kind of wounded little boy forevermore. We've all been hurt in different ways. And she asked me who benefits in your life when you're a victim. And I was trying to think, and I said, oh, maybe my friends or my family, or maybe, you know, if, if I said, if, if, if I'm not a bit of a victim, if I don't have the victim part of me, who's going to want to come to my seminar because, you know, they won't relate. And she's like, so the victim in you is keeping the victim in them alive. I was like, oh, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like a, You're propagating it like. It was, yeah, it was, it was wild. And then I looked outside and there was a fire outside and I went out and just played the drum at the fire for the day. It was great. But yeah. She yeah. must have just read David Goggins' book before she did that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it shook me with my core. Um, but yeah, back to the king. The king is, is um, you know, when I find my joy, oftentimes it points to where, where my king is online. Again, it's not conditional happiness. It's a sense of, okay, if your kingdom is the people that you love, the things that you love to do, work that is somewhat meaningful to you, and you feel like you're making an impact and a positive difference in the world, generally you'll experience a joy or a contentment. So that's kind of your sign. Um, and again, our shadow expressions, the belief I'm not enough can lead me to either becoming the weakling, and giving my power away, or becoming the tyrant and trying to hold power over others. Um, so I, I find my, my power in shadowy ways. Yeah. And again, very, very tightly linked with the warrior, but the vision, that sense of purpose, mm. without that sense of purpose, 
that idea of motivation. And motivation is a funny one to talk about as well because it can be something that you want to, it can be an excuse for some people. But not having a direction, or I speak to James about this sometimes, not understanding a general direction in which you are going, in which you want to live your life, the path you want to walk. Don't don't have to know the exact destination, Mm -hmm. but just have a general direction. You're just, you're floating. Yeah, and it's very hard to apply any of you can't like the, if if we take it in really physical, literal terms. If you have a warrior and you need to tell him who to go and fight or who to go and protect, you don't even know what that is. Yeah, they're just aimless, and you're like, go fight that person now. Go fight that person, and just kind of reactive as opposed to I know what I'm trying to achieve here. Yeah. Let's start taking the steps towards that. Yeah, um, I think I think I think it says it in that original book from the '90s that the when the king is off his throne, the warrior becomes a mercenary. The lover becomes an addict and the magician just becomes like, I can't remember what he says, but the magician is like, for me, what it looks like when my king is off the throne, I'm working and going through the motions and exhausting myself, but I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. Mm. I'm numb in my lover archetype. I don't feel anything. And then when I do feel, it's kind of extreme, like addiction. And then my magician is creating problems that aren't even there because my 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 magician's the thinking part. And if I don't give it problems to solve through my vision, it'll make up some problems. It'll there. get creative and, and come up with problems. Uh, last couple of bits, maybe to round out King. Um, we talk about some of the shadow expressions, but the goal for the King is innovation. So the capacity to bring things into, bring ideas into reality, okay. kind of similar to magician. So innovation, I can create results in my life. I can, I can, I can you know, my your your king will have created this studio, created the vision for for the podcast. The shadow, which this was a big piece for me, was to see this and like this is a big focus. Was the shadow for for the king archetype? Oftentimes, is distraction, like wanting to do it all. You've got a hundred books on the bookshelf you haven't read. You've got five instruments in the house that you don't know how to play. Yeah. That's definitely me. Like too many projects, and so a lot of developing our healthy king is being more decisive and deciding right. Um, I study with a group called K4 in the States and I've learned a lot from those guys. But they talk about the word decision comes from the root word of incision. So like suicide, homicide, um, the the side, it's about cutting off from. So to decide is to cut off from all other options. So the king needs to cut off from like most of the projects they have on and just go all in on one or two. Um, that's That's an important piece. And that's difficult as well because it's you're essentially letting go of your security blanket. Yeah. You're, you're making, I'm deciding to go this direction, which means nothing else is open to me. Yeah. Um, and once you close off those other options, it's almost like you, you're becoming accountable now mm. and you're taking responsibility. And again, it's another thing I'm really big on. And the fact that it's rooted in something deeper, I really like because I'm not obsessed is the wrong word, but very, very conscious of taking responsibility. I'm a mm. father now as well. So I've, I have responsibility. Plus, I want to own that responsibility and not be mm. the victim of the responsibility. Um, and I mentioned I've done a podcast and we were chatting before about me carrying the rock as well for me that was symbolic and I didn't understand why but I'm I'm embracing this I want this responsibility I want to take this responsibility no one gave me the rock and told me I had to carry it I picked mm. up the rock and I want to carry it mm. and it's subtle I'm still carrying the rock but now I've decided to carry the rock and my outlook on everything not everything in my life but has the ability to shift then mm. I can now look at everything in my life as okay this is my decision it's my responsibility and I can move forward and I've cut off other options or oh I have to, I have to do this now but I could I could do all these other things and put all these other things on the table as well so I don't really have to think about how much I hate doing this one thing because I haven't really made a decision on anything mm. so yeah it's, it really hits home it's very I, powerful responsibility I think is an important word for the king for sure um, to own it to own yeah, the it's, decision. it's yours. Like this is your life yeah. and um, you can blame and you can shame and you can do all that things, but it doesn't really get you anywhere. So I am where I am yeah. and, you know, I work from this place. I mean, I kind of, re- I'm 35 now and I think. It's a great age to be, man. Are you 35 yeah, as well? 35 as well. <laughs> when did you turn 35? October. Oh, so you're a little bit older than me. I'm March. Uh, and I, for the record. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I um like I've I I enjoy studying, so I've gone lots of different directions from breath work to meditation, sound healing, like warm water, all this kind of like lots of things. Someone told me like twenty two diplomas or something, which a lot of that's wow. a lot of that was insecurity, like oh I'm not I'm not fully okay. trained, so I need more training, all this kind of stuff. And there is a genuine curiosity that I do like learning and I kind of take an interest. But when I saw that about like part of the king's issue being distraction, that really shook me up a little bit a few months ago to kind of say right what do I want my life to be about not that I'm backing myself into a corner but at 35 I'm like I feel like maybe earlier years are about trying different things 
you know, learning about yourself, all that kind of stuff. I, for me, at least, there's a sense of I do want to become more committed to X, Y, and Z. You know, my health, uh, keep it simple. Jiu-jitsu, keep it simple. Uh, work, I want my work to be about shadow work, breath work, and men's work. Um, so I'm just trying, it's a big piece for me now in, in, in terms of developing my king is to refine, 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 and not be afraid to say no to nine out of 10 things that come my way. Um, yeah. How do you manage that practically saying no to all these things? Because obviously a lot of opportunity will come your way at the mm. moment. You're, you're very um, visible. There's a lot of things happening. Mm. How do, how do you manage that that no piece, that last bit where someone has offered you with potentially a job, an opportunity, whatever it might be? That I, I find that difficult as well. Hence, going back to the shadow of the warrior, yeah. the people pleaser. I, I find it difficult to say no in, in case. What if, what if in case? This could be the one. Yeah. Oh, they won't like me anymore. And then it's it's linked to my primal instincts. I'm going to die if I don't accept mm. this job because I will fail. They'll tell everybody they won't like me anymore. And how do you deal with that? I remember an, an ex years ago that had no, like, she, 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 she didn't have any great understanding of my world or what I was doing work-wise. But I remember, I think we were due to go on a holiday somewhere. And I got offered a big job and it was a lot of money. And I said to her, I've been offered this thing and I know we're on holidays. I wonder, could we change? And she said, why don't you see if they'll change the date? And I was like, oh, I can't ask them to change the date. She said, think about it. She said, they've come to you to ask you if you'll do this. And so if they want you, they'll, they'll, and I was like, wow, maybe I hadn't really considered that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I trust myself and I, 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 yeah, I trust myself and I do things my own way. So I don't really, I don't really care about them. Um, I have no problem with saying no. Yeah. Uh, and I suppose you have to prove for yourself now that your, your, your path is becoming a little bit more defined for you based on decisions you've made. So, mm. And look, I mentioned the prostitute archetype earlier. There is that sometimes um, that it's like sometimes something doesn't feel like it's not going to light me on fire in terms of like passion. But it might be something that, okay, it's a good payday. I can go in and I can share some useful bits. Not what I would choose to do as a first choice. But doing that job gives me the money to go and invest in a course that I want to do. So I don't want my life to be driven by trying to acquire money. Yes. But I will also pick certain jobs and do certain jobs because, again, I'm not out of integrity for doing them. They're not my first choice. So it's not that everything I do is exactly what I want to do. But everything has a bigger context. So it's like, if I'm doing this, and it's not well paid and I don't want to do it, I'm not going to do it. If it's if it's something I don't particularly want to do, but it's well paid, I can see, okay, that helps because that allows me to make my men's course cheaper and get more guys in my men's course, which will help them or it helps me to pay for a course or whatever it might be. I think that is so relevant nowadays to, to talk about um, once it's within your integrity, mm. not doing, you don't have to do, let me just paint the picture with an example. It might be easier for me to, to alliterate this. I'm sure lots of people reach out looking for Pat Dively to come in and sprinkle Pat Dively magic on a bunch of people. And that is the thing then. It's the, the idea of this whole, we've done the thing, we've done Pat's talk. And for you, you're probably like, okay, well, this is quite a complex topic, needs a lot more integration, needs some exercise. People will probably do with a better container for this. Kind of, so it doesn't light you on fire. And you know, you're not probably going to have the impact that you could have given a different context. However, yeah. you're not going to do any harm. Yeah. You're going to expose yourself to these people. One yeah. or two people potentially might pick up on something and go a little bit further with you, but it will also give you the opportunity to earn the money, to give you the freedom, to have more impact mm. elsewhere. And that's cool. That's okay. Yeah. I feel like nowadays, because it's so easy to target and attack people with like social media and stuff like that, once anybody does something that's interpreted as not being exactly what they're supposed to do as Pat Dively, yeah. it's very easy to say, well, look, he's fucking fraud. Yeah. He's doing this stuff. That's not that's not authentic. He's gone in there doing corporate talks and stuff. So yeah. I would imagine that's... Uh, I was over in London a couple of months ago for a bunch of corporate work. Like in some of the gigs I was in, the, like half the room sat with their backs to me for two hours. People on their phones, people during, on their laptops. During the, talk. during the talk. That's weird. And I just sat there. I thought, geez, if I wasn't getting paid for this, like I would I would want to quit my job in the morning. But yeah, of course, look, it's, it's again, it's all context. There were some lovely people there as well. Everyone was lovely, I'm sure, but um, it's a different thing. The corporate is different for me because um, people are not paying to be there. People aren't choosing to be there. Sometimes they have to oh, be there. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, You know, yeah, it's yeah. a different thing to choosing to come to a workshop. Yeah, um, they don't value it then. Yeah, varying degrees. Like some people come in and they're not really into it. And by the end, they pick up some ideas. Other people are quite into it from the get-go. Other people yeah. have no interest. So it's varying degrees. And it's uh, for me, it's about uh, adjusting my expectations as to what that session result needs to look like yeah uh, it's skin in the game thing as well like if it's your business putting this thing on you've no skin in the game they're doing mm, it it's you're mm. getting off work for half a day whatever grant yeah. if you pay for an event 
you're you're invested yeah financially but you're also invested in your mind as well i'm, I'm going to this i've paid for it i want the value out of it as well so mm. you're a little mm. bit more engaged um okay so our king anything else on the king you'd like to round up there uh in terms of like really um yeah developing your king i think is you know uh taking responsibility so maybe recognize the areas of your life where you haven't taken responsibility where you've got uh, stories about yourself or others that are you know Health was one for me recently that I, I try to up my game with my health and get a trainer and get some support and actually really go into it because I always had stories, oh, I'm busy, I'm traveling. So that was like me maybe deflecting responsibility. But the reality was I wanted to feel and, and perform better. So that one might be an example. So where are you passing the blame or passing the book? Where are you holding resentment toward other people? And can you just own where you are? That's one. Two is owning your projections. So if the unhealthy versions of the king put power on other people or hold power over other people, that's you giving away. So that's shadow. Um, there's two ways I can see shadow. There's dark shadow, which is when I see someone, I'm like, oh, he's X, Y, and Z. And I look down on them. That's me disowning the traits of myself that I, I don't want to own. But equally, when I put someone on a pedestal and they say, oh, they're incredible. That's also golden shadow. shadow. That's golden shadow. Yeah. So the more of those you can take back, it's like we've given away half of who we are. And they say the first half of our life is about kind of hiding who we are. And then the second half is about reclaiming all those different aspects. Like that's emotional maturity to say like, okay, I see some murderer on the telly and I, I point my finger and I judge and I, and maybe I've never murdered someone, but it's like, what's the energy of murder? Well, it's having no respect maybe for someone else. Okay. Where in my life do I have no respect for other people? And then I need to look at that. Wow. And that's how I integrate. So it's the energy is not necessarily the exact action. I'd see a rapist and, and then say, well, I'd never do that. But it's what is the energy behind that? It's completely taking advantage of someone. It's overlooking someone's human rights. It's um, where do I do that? And um, the more of that stuff you can reclaim. On Friday, I went to see a film with uh, Willa White. He's a great guy. Uh, oh, I met Willa. Yeah. He oh, was, you met him here. Yeah, yeah, yeah I forgot that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, Willa's in a, a, a play called The Examination. And Willa um, did time in Mount Joy years ago. And... He's playing a prisoner in this um, play and the, the play is kind of around, um, there's, a, there's, there's, there's Willa and there's another guy and the other, the other guy had been attacked I think 15 years ago and left for dead pretty much on the streets of London. So Willa's telling the story of what it's like to be a prisoner and you only get out this amount of time in the day and you've got to, you know, you've got mental health issues going on and you've no one to turn to and it's so lonely. And then the other guy is coming in and he's saying, oh, you poor thing. Oh, you just, you nearly killed someone, but you want nicer food in prison. Wow. So it's this kind of thing yeah. going on. But in Willa, in it, Willa kind of talks about, he says, you're only ever one decision away from ending up in jail yourself. And I think that's something we don't want to admit is like, we're all, we all are, you know, capable of horrific things, I think, or, you know, that's denying your shadow and pretending you're this perfect <laughs> perfectly well oh, yeah. person is, did we discuss this before about P Peterson talked about the Nazis no I don't, well, no I don't think so have you heard him speak about this no, and, no. and uh, similar enough to that um, and it's interesting he's coming from a, a, a kind of an academic mm -hmm. level and this is coming from a more emotional spiritual archetypal level but it's the same kind of, of mm -hmm. thing uh, this idea that if we lived in that era in Germany, the chances are somebody like me would probably have been indoctrinated into some form of Nazi police, SS or something like that. Because yeah. it happened. This happened is real and it's within all of us. And unless we can admit that, we're in denial of it and there's a much, much more likely chance that something like that could happen. Not that we're going to become Nazis, but mm. that in some area of our life, this is probably being expressed because we're not aware of it. Yeah. And I, f the first time I heard it without any knowledge of the shadow and like that, I was mm. like, He's actually right. Yeah. That is in me. I don't know where, but I know it's in there. Mm. And I know that he's probably right because I could pretend, obviously I no, wish no harm towards anybody, but if I lived in that era, mm. I am not the person I am now with the knowledge of that era and what happened. I'd be simply in it. Yeah. And I'd be as open to propaganda. I'm not immune to any of these things. There's one thing I really believe. I am not immune to marketing, sales, propaganda, mm. emotional manipulation. I am fully, um, I, I, I could be manipulated by any of those things. So, I potentially or probably based on my age profile and my natural disagreeableness and my 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 energy would have probably been incorporated into into one of those movements mm. and and have suppressed people and have done terrible terrible things that's in me yeah but now that I'm aware of that I can kind of hunt it out where is that expressing itself it's in yes. there where where is that in my life okay it's maybe it's here I'm not I'm not committing mass murder but I'm not very nice to this person or um, I noticed it with me in certain areas of my sporting career. There's elements of me that have a little bit of a nasty edge. But someone else made a comment and I was like, fuck this guy. And then I was like, 
he's actually right. There's a little bit of nastiness in me there as well. And that's an expression of, of that shadow that's in me. It's definitely in me. Yeah. Um, but I have found many of us are in denial of mm. that. And that means we're not aware of it where, where it does manifest. And we've obviously, we've already looked at warrior, but I was mentioning anger being the gateway emotion of the warrior. And if you take that as an example, if anger is not a concept in my mind, anger is a, an expression in my body. And so if I'm experiencing anger and that's been expressed through my body, well, it's actually not been expressed. It's been held in my body. So, you know, repeatedly people take advantage of me or I have the perception of people taking advantage of me and I feel all this heat in my body and this yeah. tension and stuff. And if I don't express that, it goes somewhere. So that could be the nasty guy that comes out on the pitch yeah. or whatever it is. So alongside all this cognitive work, I go, coming back to Warrior, maybe you need to go and punch the punch bag for a half an hour or maybe do some anger release work. Um, but yeah, this projection piece, maybe just round out the king. Um, a lot of it's how we relate it to our father. I think that coming back to that kind of father energy. Uh, if my father told me I was good enough, that's a real blessing. That's a real sense of... And all these archetypes, um, If you, there's the idea of the high chair. What do they call it? The high chair prince? Something like that. Is the idea that if you think about a child coming into the world uh, and they're in their high chair, if the parents pull him off his pedestal too quick, there's a sense of not enough. Um, you know, so if they if they start disciplining the child too quick and telling the child he's messing up, it's going to affect their confidence. If they keep the chair, if they keep the child in the, the high chair uh, too long. The child becomes like a Boris Johnson character who's pompous and, you know, he, I don't know, I'm pulling these politi political, I don't know much about them. Um, and so the, the parent's job is to like slowly, slowly bring the child down to a sense of uh, humanness. Uh, so they're not this grandiose character who thinks they're, you know, again, you think about that, the, uh, think about a prince and the first prince is just not welcomed into the world in a nice way. They're kind of pulled off their yeah. high horse, but the other one is kept on the high horse for too long. And the, the parent's job is to slowly welcome the child in and, and help them realize they're human and they're also gods of work or whatever. Um, but uh, one final exercise for the king, you might think about three things you really admire in your father and three things you really dislike about your father and just see where do those traits show up for you? Where have they showed up or where are they possibly going to show up? Just to see that your father is another man just like you. Uh, he's not a hero or a devil. He's another man on his journey and taking him off the pedestal and putting him alongside yourself can be very healing. Um, I, I think can be useful. That's a hard thing to do. Yeah. That's a hard thing to do. Because someone asked me the other day, who's my hero? I think it was James, actually. And uh, my it's my dad. Mm. But maybe that's caused some... Well, I actually know now for a fact it's caused some problems because he's my hero. Mm. It's caused some issues for me. Mm. Nothing he did, mm. but it's that relationship caused me issues mm. that I'm starting to have to work through now. Mm. Um, and it's that's a difficult thing to do to because my dad is, is an amazing man. But to view him as a man yeah. is different. Yeah, yeah. He's not the... Uh, because he is the, he is my hero. Sure. He's a superhero. Yeah. But he's also a man. Mm. That's a hard thing for me to reconcile. And I would imagine for other people. And not not everybody is lucky to have a, a really good relationship like that with their father. So there's the other side of that. Yeah. But I'm firmly on this side of my dad. And it's that's hard. It's a really hard thing in my head to try and not try and find holes, mm. but to try and reconcile certain things. Sure. Because he's been so good yeah, in yeah. my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very difficult. Yeah, Gabor Mate talks a lot about that, that, you know, sometimes... Um, He'll ask in an audience, you know, put your hand up if you had a perfect childhood and a lot of the hands in the room go up and then he talks to them and he's like, that was, the, like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> we, yeah. we justify. But I think you're doing, you're almost doing your parents, uh, you're doing, it's, it's almost a gift to be able to say, oh, like you're, you're human as opposed to you're superhuman. Yeah. But I recognize the difficulty. In it is not helpful to put anybody in a pedestal. Yeah, because they will let you down. They will let you down. I met Aubrey, I met Aubrey Marcus years ago. The and, <laughs> if you're not met. I know, yeah. I went to this conference with Aubrey. I was in his mastermind, the fit for service thing back oh, yeah. in 2017. I think Adam had a bit of a pedestal. I just, again, we don't see a lot of kings in the world. Or, and for me, he was kind of an interesting expression of he's this fit, strong dude. He's got an interesting relationship dynamic. Yeah. Um, he's got a really successful business. He's got a spiritual practice. He's like... I don't know that I had him at a pedestal, but I looked at him and I was like, oh, this guy's like, I like how he's integrating all these different aspects in an interesting way. He's got a podcast. And so I went and I met him in Texas and I just thought he was a little bit disappointed after. And then I had to check myself. I was like, what was my expectation as to what yeah. he was going to be? Do I think he was going to be a singing, dancing monkey or something? Like, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I expected because he never proclaimed to be. 
like yeah. it's yeah. the same with me sometimes people say oh you're not what I expected I was just gonna say you, quiet, you, are, you are the Irish example of this as well <laughs> uh, not that you're the Irish Aubrey Marcus or anything like that but you, it's I can imagine it's a difficult position to be in because until I've met you my only um, experience of you was true interpretation of different media some of which was your media some mm. of which was not your media mm. I know Aubrey at the moment um, it, whatever way the Aubrey Marcus thing is being portrayed it's it's lost a lot of people okay because it's like i, I now look at some of our obby stuff yeah. i don't know this guy never yeah. met this guy the same as you would have like really had this guy on a pedestal as yeah. like, on it and connected with rogan and he's fit and he's got all this stuff going on yeah. the relationship thing was a bit weird but i was like okay yeah, <laughs> yeah whatever you're into yeah. man at least he's open and vulnerable yeah. better but when you consume some of the stuff now it's it's i don't like using this word but very cultish and okay. very very lead spiritual leaderish and like I don't know if that's him. I don't know if the guy I thought he was before is him. Probably neither of them is him. Yeah. So I'm getting an I'm giving an unfair judgment of this guy that I, I don't know. And all I'm doing is seeing so much media, podcasts, videos of him. Mm. So now I'm drawing conclusions. But when you draw conclusions, those conclusions, they take life because everybody's drawing these conclusions and then everyone's talking. So this thing of this Aubrey Marcus persona is created. He might not even know about it. Yeah. That's how we all view him now. And then there's dialogue and then there's people agree and disagree. And then there's this whole world that exists and he's sitting there drinking his cup of tea and there's thousands of people having conversations about like, oh, he's this, oh, he's that. No, he's not. He's this, he's that. He saved my life. Oh, he ruined my life. And he's just there drinking his tea. Someone said, I, I, you might have heard me share this earlier, it was something like... Uh... Uh, through the thief's when a thief sees a priest he only sees the pockets or no but when, they, when a oh sorry when a thief sees a holy man all he sees is his pockets and when a holy man sees a thief he sees all of his heart or something like that so it's kind of this idea we only see through our own eyes yeah. so there's a million perceptions of you of me of Aubrey of whoever and uh, but yeah that was just an interesting note for me just to and the bigger context for that or the more useful piece potentially for people is recognize where you're stressed in relationships mm. ask yourself what's the story about how that person should be and then to figure out like did they ever say they would be that way because they probably didn't yeah. you know my partner should give me a hug every day it's like did you ever make that agreement no okay so you're getting pissed off about something they're completely yeah. unaware of that's an know? old cliche in relationships isn't it? I will change them they will become the person I want them to be yeah, 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 so yeah. I don't know if that's how it works yeah, did you ever yeah. let everyone change you <laughs> uh, okay that's the king that was a big one that was yeah. a big one yeah I'm trying to think is there any final pieces I mean the, all these are a lifetime of work as I say it's the other piece with the king to consider is just blessing. So blessing yourself and blessing others, acknowledging your gifts. Blessing yourself as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. Oh, uh, sorry, another really, really, really important part probably is, you know, if we, again, we think uh, a lot of this is metaphor, but if you think about kings, kings would associate with kings. So the kings would come together and sit around the table and break bread and whatever it might be. So it might just be considered who's in your, who's in your network. <clears throat> Do you have people you can go and share it with? Do you have people playing at your level, whatever your level is? I think that's an important aspect as well. That's an uncomfortable area. I spoke to you about it earlier on. Surrounding yourself with the type of person that you believe is going to bring you forward and elevate you and help you work on your king mm. sometimes means clearing house a little bit. Mm. And that's a very uncomfortable um, idea for people. Mm. Just like the idea of bringing people that you admire off a pedestal, people who might have been in your life for a long time. If you recognize, and there's a lot of uh, weirdness attached to this because it sounds like you are... Re have a really inflated sense of ego or whatever it might be but if you have identified a person or an energy in your life that doesn't serve you and actually detracts from your life mm. the process of restoring balance there can be a very very difficult one mm. um have you you've, you've experienced this in your life as well yeah i think this yeah yeah i've had that yeah equally like some of my best friends are the same guys I was best friends with when I was 14, 15 yeah. um, and they've lived a very uh, conventional like they would say themselves like with very different lifestyles they yeah they're, they're much more conventional lives than me I've kind of traveled four or five probably four months of the year every year for the last 10 years around the world and just you know I have a weird life I think in many ways um, so my best friends are still the people I grew up with um, but I've definitely I have recognized like the the bigger the challenges you take on in life, the bigger the levels of support that you need are. So yeah. if you want to get fit, you need support in that area. There's the idea that we'll have like three types of people. You'll have the people that are steps ahead of you that are kind of helping you up. You'll have the people on your level that you're kind of stood alongside. And then you'll have the people a couple of steps behind. And there is that piece that, you know, the, the guys that I grew up with that have never done any personal development work have some really good strengths that I'm just not strong on. So I'm learning from them. So I guess we can learn from everyone. But yeah, if you do have people that are repeatedly yeah. infringing on your desire to change it was interesting when I, when I had the gym years ago 
I had the, the fitness gym maybe 11, 11 years ago now. And there was people coming into me and, you know, it was a real community. And so people were creating massive changes in their life. And they'd tell me how much resistance they were meeting from people outside, it, uh, you know, and people were saying, oh, you're in Pat's cult and all this kind of stuff. And they hated the fact that their friends were changing. And I would just tell people, look, this is a part of life or whatever. Yeah. A couple of years on, those very same people resented me because I was changing and I wasn't a fitness guy anymore. And they'll throw the eyes up to heaven, what are you doing now? You know, no, no, no. So they didn't like the fact that I was changing, even though they had had the same experience. Okay. And I'm sure I've had experience probably of people that I have put in a box and I'm not happy that they're changing because it just challenges us, I suppose. Yeah, I just mentioned Avi Marcus, the same, I have the same perception of him now. He, he's changed a little bit, probably not as much as I think. Hmm. And now I'm like, oh. Yeah, maybe he's changed. Maybe you've changed. Maybe, maybe you, changed. you've grown and, and yeah, who knows? Yeah, I think maybe a more positive way to put this for people uh, to look at this is not going around chopping chopping heads off, mm. but rather uh, putting yourself in environments with the type of people that you would like to interact with and you will, you are inspired by. And then it, it will nat you will naturally create a, a better environment for yourself, I suppose, rather than going around saying, you're done, you're done, you're done. Yeah, people can you're get fired. kind of polarized and feel the need to like action yeah. those things. Yeah, I think if you distance a little bit, distance where you need to create a bit of distance. And, yeah. Um, yeah, there is like there is that other piece, right, that people have a sense of obligation that I grew up with this guy, so I've got to be friends with him forever. Which yeah. is like you grew up just by chance, you grew up in the same place. And just by chance you, you yeah. both like WWF or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. That's a lovely round out for the uh, the king. king. Yeah. Where would you like to go next? Magician or lover? Uh, magician, maybe. Yeah, magician. So um again, we're thinking about these three um uh you know, king, structure, vision, blessing greater good of all that's a you can the, the, well, another word for the king is the heart-centered leader um, so kind of got the greater good of all the warrior taking action protecting what's important having healthy boundaries maybe just one short analogy i sometimes share on the boundaries piece is having no boundaries is like having your house and a garden around the house and there's no fence so people come and go and you get pissed off at some point you're like oh i'm sick of people coming into my space so you put a 10-foot wall up around the house so you go from no boundary to 10-foot high wall yeah. And sometimes with ourselves, we can have that same experience. I'm sick of people emailing me. Okay, so I'm shutting down my emails. You know, this kind of extreme yeah, yeah. reactions rather than responses. But our magician then we might think about as almost the right-hand man to the king, that the king's got this vision, but the magician helps to go into the details. And the magician slows things down and gets perspective and is not emotionally invested in things, is able to kind of take a step back and say, okay, what's going on here? The magician relates to... Um, transformation in many ways so like if we think about the world that we're in we might look at people like steve jobs or elon musk as being people that are changing the way that we see the world changing the way that we see so that's kind of an external expression of change but it also magician relates to our internal experience of change so you mentioned the hero's journey earlier on and the hero's journey is this mono myth so the joseph campbell recognized this common story in all stories that we relate to where the hero is in their ordinary world living their ordinary life and then something prompts them to leave their ordinary world and go into an unknown world. They get this call to adventure. And in the unknown world, they meet new mentors. They have challenges. They enter the dark cave that holds the dragon. They have these massive challenges. And eventually they return to their ordinary world. But they're a different person now. And usually they've got gifts for the tribe. Like, And what that metaphor represents is us going into our shadow. So the unknown world is doing something you've not done before never been in an intimate relationship before I'm going to go into that and now I go into the unknown world this doesn't feel safe I feel scared I feel vulnerable I feel insecure I've all this stuff comes up those are the those are the metaphorical challenges you're facing and then when you reach the point where you're like I can't do this anymore that's you fight, meeting the dragon and um, so the hero's journey um, again is a lot about magician because when your fears come up oftentimes we allow fear to have a step back and go back to safety but fear can be the gateway. So the gateway for the magician, the emotion related to the magician is about fear, stepping into our fears, finding perspective. Um, the wound, when we're kids, oftentimes we take on the belief that I'm, it's a sense of shame. I'm bad or I'm flawed in some way. There's something wrong with me. I'm weird. There's, I'm just I'm just inherently flawed. And it's different to I'm not enough because I'm, en I'm not enough. I can kind of do something with it. I can become enough potentially. But the sense of shame that I'm flawed or I'm bad or I'm wrong or when we take on that message as kids, 
we can sometimes lose access to our magician. So magician, again, is the thinking part that can find perspective, that can remain neutral, that can take a step back, that can slow things down, that can vision and plan and strategize, really use our intellect uh, to our advantage. Um, when we believe that we're wrong or we're bad, sometimes our intellect becomes skewed. So we either become the dummy and the dummy is the person who almost disidentifies from the intellect. And there's a sense of, I can't do things. I have no idea how to do that. I'm, I'm stupid. I just can't figure things out. Oh, I don't want to make a decision. I'll make the wrong decisions. It's almost like abdicating responsibility in many ways, I suppose. And um, being afraid to have an opinion in case they have the wrong opinion. Being very neutral, being very kind of passive. And then on the other side, you've got the manipulator. So that's the person who uses their intellect to their advantage. You might think of a pickup artist who uses slimy tactics and tricks to win a woman over yeah. or um, an internet marketer. Uh, they're using their intellect to manipulate people. Um, so, Or it could be someone that shares a little bit of information to make people think they're helping them, but then withholds the stuff that will really make an impact. Yeah. So they're the shadows. Um, disidentifying, I'm a dummy, I can't do things, I can't learn things, I can't change my situation or the other side of the coin. Um yeah, manipulating other people. Uh, um, and these are both methods, I guess, of, um, you know, if I take on the belief that I'm bad or I'm flawed in some way, I can either believe it and I'm like, I'm, I can't do things, da, 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 or I can try and hide my insecurities, hide my badness, hide my shame. Uh, so maybe I point the finger at all the ways other people are shamed. So that's my manipulator. Yeah. Maybe. What seems to be coming across to me about the magician is when we talk about the, war the warrior and the king, it's a lot more visceral. And with the magician, a lot of what you just described there, many of us could be could be acting out in our lives in terms of that shadowy side of the magician without even recognizing it. Mm. So it's more about having that awareness. You need awareness, obviously, in all areas of your life, but it's very important because a lot of that could go unchecked for your entire life without you ever actually recognizing. Yeah, an important aspect of the magician. I mean, this stuff goes deep, right? You could spend your whole life studying the archetypes, but there is a character known as the safety officer. And the safety officer is the part of us that when we're young and we experience difficulties, the safety officer says, shit, I don't want to experience this again. So if I get bullied, my safety officer comes in and says, I'm going to keep the little boy safe. So he might come up with strategies. Okay, become the tough guy, become the funny guy. Okay, keep people at arm's length. So our safety officer as kids develops strategies to keep us safe from being hurt or from being exposed in some way. And what we might find is 20 or 30 years later, those strategies are still playing out. So now the safety officer has become a prison officer and you're confined to this prison cell of having to show up in a certain way. Um, so part of the magician work again is when I meet fear. So if I meet fear in my life, let's say I'm afraid of public speaking. Fear is the gateway. There's a message in that. If I can take a step back and say, oh, I'm probably afraid of public speaking because I tried this when I was young and, and it was terrifying and I messed it up. And so there's an opportunity for transformation. This is the key. If I can channel my healthy magician, I can create transformation potentially in my life. Okay. Okay. Mm. Because you have that strategy then to follow. And again, like it, it's, it's so funny thinking back on all the movies I've ever would have seen or books I would have read with, within this fantasy world. There's always that king figure and then the magician is in the background. But sometimes there can be the evil, the evil dark sorcerer as well. And yeah. they're the manipulator and they're the person who's yes. kind of trying to get into the ear of the, the protagonist, the young young person who's on the hero's journey and you have that shadow there just saying, no, come this direction. But then Merlin, the good magician is there saying, no, we want to do it. It's, it's so interesting to see these played out over and over again in front of our eyes, like yeah. Disney and stuff yeah. like this. Um, yeah, the, the, the challenge somewhat with the magician in the modern world is the magician, like, if the magician and king were consulting in, in a kingdom, usually the magician would go off to the woods and he'd kind of sit on his own in the woods for a few days and he'd kind of let, he'd let things, let, yeah. let this Talk stuff to the go. spirits and yeah, absorb yeah. the energy. Yeah. yeah, genuinely do all those things. And, and now, because the, the world is so fast paced, I'll give you an example. I work with a corporate coaching client recently, I do a little bit of executive coaching. And, and one of the challenges he was facing was the higher the hires up within his company were demanding results at a very quick pace. So they were the kings or the warriors. They were very much kind of, we want the result and we wanted it now. But his work was magician work. It was more around the details and it could take a full day to figure out one little thing that was needed. And so it can be difficult for the magician, uh, the, the king and warrior types to recognize that the magician needs to slow things down because the world kind of operates at a king's speed. Yeah. It's production, 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 production. But for innovation to happen, 
like for Steve Jobs to create the iPhone or for Elon Musk to create all he's created, they need to step back. Yeah. They need to take their asset or whatever yeah. they do. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a different pace of being. So for us in a practical sense, what it might be is daily meditation, daily yeah. time for journaling, a little bit of time in nature. It could be therapy, it could be shadow work. It's do you have time in your life on a consistent basis to step back out of, they talk about the, um, uh, what do they call it? The profane, I think the profane world. Uh, and sorry, profane space. So like your day to day, the the average, and then uh, liminoid space. Liminoid space is where uh, transformation can happen, and liminal space is where. I guess like if you go to an ayahuasca ceremony, for an example, when you step out of that ceremony, you're in liminal space now because there's an opportunity to change. You've had new insights, and now it's where this is where the change can actually start to happen. Yeah. Whereas in the day to day, you're just kind of in the in the thick of it. So healthy magician work has kind of create space in my life on a consistent basis to ponder, to think, to learn new things about myself or learn new things externally, use my intellect. Kind of linked with that Carl Jung idea of making the unconscious conscious, sitting by yourself, giving yourself some 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 time without input yeah. to, to process. Yeah, shadow work is really, yeah. is real magician work. Yeah. That's fascinating because, and you mentioned the ceremony and stuff, that, that really is what it does. It, it removes you from all of that noise, it gives you other noise, obviously, but it removes you from all of that external noise, and um, especially done in ceremony. Mm. You have that space mm. and it's space to obviously work with the medicines and stuff, but also for you just to gather your thoughts, like just to write phones off, everyone's gone, no one's interrupting here, unless someone coming over telling me to stop crying. And, uh, <laughs> stop being <laughs> it's a, a bit of victim, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, it's, it's about creating that space. And I know I am. Um, I use that quote all the time by Blaise Pascal, like the root of most of man's problems is his inability to sit quietly by himself mm. for five minutes. And uh, I've said this multiple times, but like it's it's a very hard thing to do. But Jesus, it's so powerful mm. because it's so noisy now. The silence is stark. So when you do have five minutes, even five minutes of just sitting, not even meditation or breath work, just sitting, you you can all of a sudden observe the, the busyness of your mind. And that has to affect the healthy magician that just has to affect because you have no space there to actually consciously process and plan so then your king doesn't have the information he needs and the warriors all over the place as a mercenary so it's all downstream and that's so fascinating man it's yeah. so cool um the other piece about magician i mean there's so much but i don't know if we talked about initiation on our first podcast or people we about touched it. on i spoke with niall about mm. it as well um yeah so the simple for anyone who's not heard those episodes um we think about traditionally in tribal culture once boys got to a certain age, there was a recognition that there's an energy shifting in the boys. So as they become teenagers, rather than saying he's hormonal or he's a pain in the arse, they say there's something looking to shift here. There's alchemy looking to happen. Something's trying to transmute into something else. There's an energy moving. It's like the restless energy that we get when we're not happy with something in life. We can kind of beat ourselves up or numb ourselves to it. Or we can say, oh, something's looking to shift here. There's new something looking to emerge. So in initiation, the boys would be taken away from the village and they'd go through this rites of passage where it could be walking around the land for a year. It could be getting, usually they'd be represented, or a wound to represent like what they were going through. Um, but the magicians in the village were a key aspect of the initiation process because they would kind of uh, hold space. They'd yeah. hold the container. Um, so when I do a workshop, you know, I facilitate a workshop, that's very much me and my magician, like holding the space for people to create potential transformation. Or the shaman in the medicine ceremony is very much in healthy magician holding the space. It could be holding the space for others. It could be holding the space for yourself. Um, an important thing with initiation is you can't like plan out the thing. It's not going to be clean. It's not going to look the way you think it's going to look. So you need that kind of, you're just holding the space and trusting that spirit comes through and, and works through that space. Yeah. So similar, like when you meditate, you can't, there's no one being in your warrior trying to fucking get it right. And yeah, stuff like that. You've yeah, got to yeah. be a magician, just hold the space, trust what comes through and. Uh, listen it's about deep listening i would say okay mm -hmm. and i'm not asking you to point fingers here i'm just asking for a general observation and um, nowadays with a lack of especially in our culture a lack of that initiation do you observe working with so many men that a lot of us are struggling because i know i do with being a man boy mm -hmm. I, i've had no official crossover there's been no official crossover there for me mm -hmm. and maybe perhaps because my dad was so good to me mm -hmm. there was no real element of challenge that I had to rise to to delineate my manhood I'm now a man mm. I just kind of have cruised through the, for me the biggest one was being handed a baby I was like there you go yeah. there's a bit and you're like whoa fuck but I'm 30 like so I'm, I'm, I'm t already in my head I think I am a man but I'm actually not I'm a boy and this is an initiation for me a responsibility here it is bam I was mm. like whoa holy shit and I've seen that a lot with uh, it can really disrupt 
somebody's life because I wasn't prepared for it, I suppose, for, for this mass of massive responsibility. It's now crafted who I am today, so it's been a positive outcome. Mm. But it, uh, do you observe that in the modern world with men? Yeah. Uh, a, a kind of a a boyishness in terms of responsibility and, and all these feelings and shadow because of a lack of some sort of initiation process nowadays. Yeah, I see it myself as well. I mean, it, it, they call it the Poer Eternus, which is like the eternal child. That's the Marie von Franz and Carl Jung would talk about the Poer Eternus. Um, and it's epidemic now. So the idea of like just sitting around playing computer games mm. and <laughs> never growing up. Um, I think there's a couple of things like back in the day with the initiations, the idea was like if, if there's 100 people in the village and I was sent out on my initiation as a teenager to step from boyhood to manhood, it wasn't about me as an individual becoming a man. It was about the context of the village. Yeah. So if I don't grow up and if the boys don't grow up, then in a couple of years, the village is ran by boys and that's not good. And so a big piece in it was like, what is the gift you're bringing back to the village? There's a really good uh, teacher, Maladoma Sume. He died maybe two years ago. And he wrote a book, uh, he's read a bunch of books, but one of the books he talks about uh, in his tribe, when a woman would become pregnant, uh, she would go and sit under this tree and the local shaman would go and sit with her and he'd sing and he'd connect with the spirit of the baby in her tummy. And he would figure out the baby's name and the purpose of figuring out the baby's name was the baby had a role. The baby was being brought into the village for a reason. So maybe they're, I don't know, the cook or the whatever they might be, um, the soldier, the warrior. And they were given a name based on their role. And the idea was that every time that baby heard their name in their lifetime, they were reminded that it, their life was not about them. It was about the bigger context and where they fit wow. in with the village, which I thought, which I thought was nice. Because in those villages, if there's a hundred people and everyone in the, I'm taking that hypothetically a hundred people, but if the, everyone in the village has got a role within the hundred people, we're all of value and we all have purpose and meaning. Because if you're the baker and you die, then we've lost our baker and that's a massive, or you're sick or anything happens. Um, and so there, I think in the modern day, the internet and this, like everything's open up. So there's a million personal trainers, there's a million life coaches, there's yeah. a million podcasters. And so maybe we don't have that same sense of purpose and meaning because maybe we don't feel the same sense of contribution. And when you don't have purpose and meaning and you don't have community and you don't have tribe and you don't have elders, yeah. maybe the result is the boy return So the eternal boy who doesn't want to commit to things, um, Oh. We're, spoiled for, we're spoiled for choice in many ways it's what I was saying earlier about me trying to narrow my focus and, and outgrow that part of me again there's benefits I think to the part of me that's curious about lots of different things yeah. but it's also there is some like eternal boy in that that doesn't want to grow up yeah. that doesn't want to commit to certain projects doesn't want to commit to people um, doesn't want to take responsibility yes yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah for sure it's, it's and that's so tricky nowadays because what you just described that situation there with the, the elder and the woman that's now called depression Mm. And you being told that this is your role in in the world is now called oppression as well. Yeah. Whereas realistically, the same thing is happening. It's just a little bit more insidious. Whereas we're told you will be successful and happy if you do this particular job and have this much money. Before it was, you will contribute to the tribe and you will be part of a community and have a purpose. Um, so it's just been kind of hijacked, I think, by whatever mm. what, whatever kind of forces you want you want to go into. Don't go into it now. But uh, yeah, it's difficult to have that conversation now. A man is telling a woman what her ch her child is going to be called and what that position in, in a society is now. Now as individual and enlightened beings, we all think I make those decisions for myself but it's for myself, not for the greater good. And I think maybe that's where it gets a little bit tricky because we're making decisions purely based on us and what we think is right and we're empowered mm. and just forgetting about the, the collective. For From a very practical standpoint, I think the lack of community is a massive issue for us all. Like yeah. uh, uh, when I used to have a gym, I used to call it a fitness gym, but it was about community. Now I do workshops. It's like a men's workshop, but really it's about community yeah. and it's kind of uh, getting outside of our own head and our own self. Um, but yeah, that was the magician's role in all of that was kind of facilitating change within themselves and also within the village. Yeah. Um, holding sacred space in a practical sense for us on a day-to-day -day basis. Like I've got an altar now in my house where I go and I meditate every day. Really? Yeah. yeah, it's just about like stepping away from my everyday profane, you know. Giving um, yourself the space. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and just having somewhere where, okay, this is what this area of the house is for, just to sit and journal or to meditate or whatever. So it's it's a it's a clean break from the rest of the house where it's, work or it's cooking or whatever it might be you know yeah. that's massive because environment is hugely powerful huge yeah. um so yeah developing a healthy magician i think it's you know having a practice of how do you listen to yourself yeah. um also maybe recognizing those shadows so the dummy where the parts it was interesting i was in a men's group years ago and one of the prompts they gave us was to think about something your father didn't teach you that you wish he taught you so 
Um, I didn't think much of it. I, I can't even remember what I came to. But one guy was very emotional and he said his father never taught him how to shave. I don't think my father taught me to, how to shave. But this guy was very emotional over, you know, my father never taught me how to shave. And the prompt we were given was to go and like, he, he had to go to a barber and book in for a lesson on how to shave. It was kind of like about healing that part of yourself. And I guess in some ways the dummy, like that part of us, the, the shadow magician that thinks we can't do things. Oh, I'm no good at cars. Oh, I'm no good at DIY. A healthy healing piece could be to figure out which of those things you could actually get some support on and learn and give yourself a chance to learn and to develop. Um, yeah. And and to bring it back to the original point you made, to have a strategy for that as well so you can actually implement it. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. Giving yourself the space is part one and then part two is whatever comes to you in that space. Yes. Being able to actually put that down some in some format and then give it to the king and allow the king to issue the instructions to the, to, to the warrior. And um, so having some forward moving action on that as well the implementation I suppose is, yeah. is probably what it's referred to a lot and maybe the m manipulator then is that piece you talked about earlier with the subtle lies the white lies yeah. the 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 trying to impress or the the stretching the truth and uh, so I think developing healthier health developing healthy uh, magician you could consider going and doing an initiation of sorts that could be many different things it could be a vision quest and uh, that could be uh, an initiation with the mankind project or one of these groups that do them it could be going and climbing a mountain. Yeah, many things you could do for initiation, but it's kind of like a before and after. Who are you before you step into the thing? What's your intention? Who will you be after? Yeah, I've often thought about that. Like if I'm if I want to have a family, the vision quest is where you go f sit for four days and four nights Jeez. in the wilderness with nothing, um, no tarp. They're done differently, but just a little fire potentially for yourself. You sit in a circle, no writing materials, no reading materials, no nothing. And the idea is you're creating the environment where spirit can come and talk to you as all you fast. You, you, you you've just, done this. No, Niall. Yeah. Niall's done a bunch of <laughs> vision of course, quests. Of yeah, course, Niall yeah, has yeah. done this. Yeah. And he's going to support me when I do. But I, I did think about that. Like if, if uh, you know, if, if I want to have family, that would be good. Like it's good to go with a question. Like if you got a lack of clarity, imagine going with a question, do I want to start a family? And then going yeah. and sitting for four days, like that would be a different level of. Wow. I can't even do it for four minutes, like four days. <laughs> it's, it is, it's, I, know I said it facetiously, like, but it is, it's, it is a challenging concept for me because I think I've mentioned this before. If you've never trained, the idea of running a marathon is just obscure. It's an abstract notion. You're like, I could run a marathon. Mm. If you've ever tried to run a 5K, you realize there's a lot of work goes into running a marathon. Yeah. You've context for it. Yeah. Anyone, I, Probably the best example is people giving McGregor a hard time, but everything about his social life, watching him saying, why is he just, he's just lying there hugging your man on the floor. I, I never would have tapped. Yeah. If you've even tried any sort of martial art before, MMA, any sort of grappling, you'd be like, okay, mm. 20 seconds in, I'm gassed here. Mm. There's nothing left. Oh, now I have context for what this is. Yep. So the idea of a four day retreat for me, um, Vipassana, a friend of mine did Vipassana on us. Yeah. I, can't, I, I, I now know what, I have context for that, sure. so it terrifies me because five to ten minutes is hard enough for me. And mm. um, but it's a pro it's a journey, it's a process. So you don't have to dive in to do a four day vision quest. <laughs> you could start off by giving yourself ten seconds to breathe in a day. Potentially ties in with um, magician in the sense of like there's this you know the four stages of learning. So they say like first we're unconsciously incompetent. So like I don't know what I don't know. Oh yeah, and then we become unconsciously competent. So I become aware. Of maybe I can see if oh, I'm writing this. Consciously uncompetent. Consciously, consciously uncompetent. Sorry. So now I I know what I don't know. Is it uncompetent so, or incompetent? Incompetent. Um, I don't want to correct I'm you. I'm, I'm, not even I'm not even sure. I'll use, the, I'll use an example. <laughs> Baby in the back of a car has no idea that like someone's driving the car and it's just like not. Yeah. Then you get a bit older. You're like oh well, someone's driving the car. Like I don't really know how to do that. But that's kind of cool. Consciously incompetent. Then, then yeah, you yeah. start uh, doing driving lessons. You're like oh Jesus. Like now I know what I don't know. That's the bit where most people will quit. And then eventually you're okay. doing it, you're tying your shoelaces or you're listening to music yeah, and singing or whatever. Yeah. So the bit where most people quit and maybe that dummy character comes in and says, I can't do this. Okay. Is the bit where you recognize the gap between where you want to be and where you are. Ah, um, okay. Like a car is maybe a silly example, not a silly example, but I, do, I feel like social, in terms of society, we go to school at this, we go to primary school at the same age. And then it's kind of given that you go to secondary school now. So everyone around you is stepping into this new thing Then maybe college or a trade. And then you're stepping into your new thing. And then maybe all your friends start getting married around the same age. So you're stepping into a new thing. But a lot of these initiations are with other people around you doing the same thing. And I think the most challenging of initiations, like the hero's journey, which is unique to us, is oftentimes a call within us to change something, but nobody around you is changing. Uh, and so yeah. that's when it's difficult when you become aware of 
okay, there's a call in me wanting to do this thing, but now I recognize I'm way off where I need to be in order to do that thing. Yeah. Uh, so maybe that's where your magician comes in. He says, okay, we can, let's stay here. Let's take a step back. Let's look at things differently. Let's acquire the skills we need. Let's make yeah. space. Let's stay neutral. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Okay. And <laughs> to, to round it off, it's one everybody's been waiting for. The They've seen the title of this podcast, yeah. The Lover. Let's mm. get into The Lover. What, what does this uh, represent? Uh, connection would be the key word. So if we think about... Actually, just to share, uh, you know, we talked about on Warrior, we said there's decisiveness in the Warrior, which is great, but there's also an impatience sometimes where why isn't everyone working at this pace? And uh, we said in The Lover, or we didn't say, or sorry, we're going to The Lover now. We said with The King, one of the gifts is we create things like we innovate in the world. One of the challenges is distraction. We want to do it all. I'm just trying to refine. Uh, for The Magician, a skill set for The Magician is mastery. So like really going deep into the detail, like really interested in oh, learning more. Um, I like the, it's like me, like studying all this stuff. That's my magician. That's really interesting getting in there. The king doesn't really care about the details in that way. The warrior doesn't have the patience for that, but my magician loves to, but the shadow, uh, sometimes for the magician, two, two things. One is like perfectionism, afraid to put something out there because it's not perfect and it's never going to be perfect because there's so much more I need to learn. And also isolation. Sometimes the magician can isolate. So the part of us that's really detail oriented, it can be kind of nerdy and not want to connect. But then finally, the lover. So if you think king, warrior, magician are very much um, future focused, like I'm creating something, I'm going somewhere, but they're kind of all around vision um, and they're kind of doing based as opposed to being. So the the lover is um, being. A lover relates to connection. So how do I connect to myself and my emotion? Uh, how do I connect to others? How is my capacity to be present? Um, live through the senses. So sexuality, sensuality will live largely through the lover archetype. My... Uh, interest in music or art or experiential things that are not about a result but about being a lot of these relate to healthy warriors the healthy warrior is able to connect and share like compassionately share authentically share vulnerably uh, feel all of their emotions so not just the good emotions but all emotions and um, able to slow down enjoy the present moment, um live through the senses um see the color in life i suppose oftentimes when you lose your healthy lover things are a bit gloomy um, the wound so again if we come into the world and we're kind of everything's possible but then we take on these wounds the wounds for the lover is I don't know how to love or I'm not lovable so if we take on that belief that I don't know how to love properly or I'm not lovable we typically respond in two ways to so the shadows on this one on one side of the coin we become kind of numb so this is called the impotent so the impotent is someone who's kind of numb detached a bit vacant very much in warrior so always doing uh, oftentimes but but struggles to feel struggles to connect, um, can be somewhat reclusive. Life can feel a bit depressive. You could mm. call it depressive as well. Um, so that's one side of the coin. Um, I don't, I'm unlovable. I don't know how to love. So I just kind of disconnect from my feelings. Um, you'd see this a lot with men who are like maybe in the corporate world and just like switched on, boom, 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 boom. But there's a, there's a struggle to feel. And then the polarity, the other side is the addict. So the addict is very much driven by feeling. It's like, maybe I want to change my emotional state. Uh, maybe I tell myself repeatedly, I'm not going to do that thing anymore. But then the feeling just pulls me into an addictive behavior. Sometimes for the addict, there's a struggle with connecting with people. So they find the connection through substance because there's no vulnerability involved with that. They can't be rejected by a substance. Um, what else with the addict? Addict, sometimes there's a lot of like loving drama. Um, maybe they love bomb I think that's the expression where like you meet someone for the first time and, oh my god you're the most amazing person I've ever met and there's a lot of that kind of high intensity you know drama like an anxious attachment style I guess um, so those would be the, the kind of two extremes um, I'm completely overran by my feelings and everything is based on how I feel and trying to change how I feel or I'm detached from my feelings and, and the practicality is you might get someone who's numb during the week and hates a lot of what's going on in their life and then goes into addiction on the weekends to help. Um, yeah. Yeah. To help cope, I suppose. Yeah. 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 I, it's it's so nice. If to finish on the lover actually is really nice as well. Having gone through practical examples of where the king, warrior, magician may exhibit themselves in our lives to look at the lover as the coping strategy almost for dysregulation in the other areas. Mm. If you just think about that average story we hear so often nowadays is I hate my job, nine to five, live for the weekend and what do I do on the weekend? Just, just, just drown myself, drown my fears or my sorrows or 
uh, distract myself from the fact that I don't have a purpose. I don't have a vision. I don't give myself space and time. I'm completely overwhelmed. I have all of this shadow going on that I'm not acknowledging. So what do I become? An addict. An addict to distraction, to substances, to things that don't judge, that don't point their finger, that don't shine light into the shadow for me. Mm. Um, that's one I would recognize more so, I would think, just as a general observation, then the other side of it, a, a, an overload of, of emotion. Although I, I've seen that in me as well, that kind of anxious attachment style and the, the almost des desperate outpouring of emotion and uh, and energy. Mm. Um, but yeah, an imbalance in any of those first three we spoke about is obviously going to lead to you not wanting to feel those feelings mm. and to becoming addicted, I suppose, to, to things that are going to help you to cope with the fact that all of this is completely out of out of kilter that's so interesting and um, attachment styles you could think about the numb or the the impotent as being the avoidant attachment so I don't I just want to be on my own I don't want to yeah. don't want to connect the addict is more of an anxious attachment and then the healthy lover is the secure attachment so I have a healthy sense of self I can also connect to others um, there's not that longing to lean in or lean back there's kind of a solid yeah. middle ground um, and to, to, to refer back to my comment about we don't live in a vacuum as well there's other influences at play this is, I think, where it now gets really difficult. This conversation is very pertinent because let's take, for example, pornography. Mm. Now, it's not necessarily downstream of a dysregulation in the other archetypes. Now, it's it's everywhere. It's so readily available mm. that you could bypass all of the issues there and jump straight into, as a young man, into pornography and become addicted to pornography. Not necessarily because... You haven't. I mean, you haven't even developed to a point where you maybe have issues with your king or your 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 um your other archetypes. But now you've ready access to this thing that you become addicted to, which then negates you ever having to go and give yourself space or time. You're completely addicted to this thing, and mm. it could be social media, and it could be drink, and it could be food, and it could be many different things. And mm. um, but pornography is a big one nowadays for young men, especially. Yeah. And that immediately, without having had to have gone through twenty years of trauma and bad relationships and then maybe be seeking comfort from porn you've just it's just been shoved in your face every single day and now you're addicted to that thing physiologically mm. which is then going to have f effects inevitably on the other areas of your archetype as well so mm. it's, it's actually a bit of a mess yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh god that's crazy mm. do, do you see that as an issue nowadays with men specifically um yeah. The, the, and not, not porn necessarily, but mm. the, the the ease of access to these distractions. Whereas before, we didn't have easy access to alcohol or drugs or porn and things like that. Um, you could get them if you really wanted to, and it would be the person right at the bottom of the barrel who would end up addicted to these things. Mm. But now you're not at the bottom of the barrel, and you can still have an issue. So many people nowadays are addicted to alcohol, but it's socially acceptable as a drug, and it makes a lot of money for corporations. So mm. that's not a problem for us. Mm. Whereas before, you needed money to get alcohol, or you needed access to get alcohol, or not everybody could get alcohol. So you really had to be at the bottom of the barrel and go seeking this stuff out. Mm. But you don't now. Yeah, I mean, the, these industries make money off uh, us being dysregulated and us being off kilter. Um, that's the reality, I guess. Yeah. Um, a society they can't feel is disconnected from their hearts. And if you're disconnected from your heart, you're not going to know what you want to do in life. You're not going to be able to relate to people. And when you have that sense of disconnection from yourself or from others or from your work or whatever, you're going to want to know them or you're going to want to feel something. Um, so, yeah, it is a vicious, I think it's a vicious circle. Um Particularly for boys, I mean, boys are taught you're not supposed to feel. Uh, boys don't cry. I will say the only emotion that was safe to show as a boy was anger yeah. because anger would let me keep people at arm's length, whereas sadness or joy or any of the others were frowned upon. Weakness. Weakness, yeah. And we, we don't get emotional training. Like, how do I... The example I share in the, in the workshops is to say that, like, when a baby cries... We don't look at the baby and say, why is the baby crying? Well, we do. We say, why is the baby crying? But not from a judgmental pay of, oh, the baby shouldn't be crying. We yeah. say, oh, the baby needs something. Yeah. And so mom or dad will pick up the baby, we'll rock the baby, we'll feed the baby, we'll recognize, oh, it needs something. So we're going to give it what it needs. As adults, if we cry or we uh, want to cry or we feel anxious or we feel fear, we feel any feeling that's uncomfortable, oftentimes we tell ourselves in our head, I shouldn't feel this way. And oftentimes we relate to our emotions the same way our parents would have taught us to relate to our emotions. So if I grew up and I felt anxious and I said, oh, I feel anxious and my parents responded with, I didn't have time to feel anxious when I was young. I was so busy. Yeah. Or you feel fearful and your parents say, don't be silly. Now there's this disconnect. You're like feeling stuff in your body and your superhero parent is saying, don't be silly. Yeah, I didn't have time for that. So this creates a disconnect and oftentimes then in our adult lives we might find ourselves using the same kind of lingo. I shouldn't feel this way. I, I don't have time to feel this. Da, da, da. So we recreate those same cycles. 
So developing and like reintegrating the healthy lover is very much about like allowing ourselves to feel again. That can be done through breath work. That can be done through meditation, through body work. That can be done like a really simple starting point. I have a resource that I share with people, which you'll find easily online, is a, a wheel, an emotions wheel that uh-huh. has a list of probably 100 mo- emotions on there. And you just look on the emotions and you say, what do I feel today? And just try to get better at naming how you feel. I often talk about like visiting this girl I know in New York a couple of years ago. I don't know if I told this story last time I was on. I met her at Aubrey Marcus's group and she said, if you're ever in New York, come and stay. So I was in New York a few months later. I met her for 10 minutes before that. I didn't know the girl at all. And I went and stayed with her in New York for a week in Brooklyn. And every day she'd say, Pat, how do you feel? I'm like, I feel good. And she'd be like, that's not a feeling. I feel fine. She'd say, that's not a feeling. I feel grand. She's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And I looked at her and I was like, how do you feel? Just half taking the piss. And uh, she goes, oh, amazing question. I feel grateful and excited and enthusiastic. And at the time I thought she was daft. But when I came home, I thought, no, I'm the daft one. I have no concept of how I feel most of the time. I can tell you when I'm really anxious or about to have a panic attack. But aside from that, I don't really know. Um, So I tried to develop the skill of how do I feel? Like every day, how do I feel? What do I need? How do I feel? What do I need? How do I feel? What do I need? I feel resentment. What do I need? I need to have a conversation with someone. I feel anxious. What do I need? I need some certainty. I feel lonely. What do I need? I need some connection. So all of our difficult feelings just point to unmet needs. But we've been taught you should only feel certain things. The other piece on that is that a feeling or an emotion is just a collection of sensations in your body. So fear is like tightness in the chest, flush in my face, fast speed in my system. And I, I notice these sensations and I label them and I say, I'm scared. And then as soon as I give it a label and I say, I'm scared, I go to my head and I start thinking, why am I scared and how do I stop being scared? So I've ran away from my body and I've gone to my head and now I'm stuck up here. And in reality, oftentimes all that's needed is to breathe into whatever is there. So, okay, there's tightness in my chest, there's speed in my body, there's flushness in my face, I'm just going to breathe. And then I take a couple of breaths. Okay, there's a little bit of ease now in my chest. Okay, temperature's dropping a little bit in my face. And sometimes that's all it takes is, is a bit of movement. Um, but yeah, how we relate to our emotions is to keep peace with the lover. If I make half of my emotions wrong, I can only be half of who I am. And then when any of the other stuff emerges, I find myself reaching for addictions or yeah. lashing out or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, and like, again, it, it, for me and for many people listening, that could be as simple as reaching for your phone. When something, when you feel slightly dysregulated, just go to your phone. Yeah. Scroll on Instagram, check your emails, whatever it might be, but it's just another form of distraction because yeah. sitting with that is very uncomfortable. Yeah, and people often ask like, oh, can we overthink this stuff? And you certainly can. You can spend, we, we talked about it before recording. We said you could spend your life getting caught in all this stuff. And yeah. so the practicality of this stuff for me is like, okay, what's something that's getting in the way of my life right now? Oh, I drink too much. Okay, what's what's the action I'm going to take for the next month on that? Okay, I'm going to remove alcohol for a month. I'd just be looking at like one piece that you don't need to explore every childhood belief you took on. You don't need to explore every addictive tendency you've got in your life. You just got to pick one thing and work on that and yeah. just kind of trust that life. I think life has always given us material to work with. So I mentioned people in my life recently where I'm like, I feel like I'm getting taken advantage of here. I feel like I only hear from these people when they need things. To me, that's life giving me all this material to work with and I can ignore it and continue to be resentful or I can practice using my voice, using my words, using yeah. my boundaries. Uh, and then the next lesson will emerge and then the next one and the next one. So I think you trust your own journey. What I found so funny about this world, and you could probably speak to this because you're, you're well experienced, is you could start on your personal development journey and someone will say to you, you should do breath work, mm. you should journal, mm. you should connect with other people, you should live a compassionate, good life and you're like, oh, whatever. And you can do 10 years of personal development and courses and meeting people and podcasts and traveling the world and you'll come back to journaling yeah. and breath work and meditation and nature and compassion. But then you'll have learned the why of all of that mm-hmm. the, and the, 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 how it actually affects you when you've connected with it and certain parts will resonate with you. So then when you come back to actually sit down and do it, you're like, now I understand why I'm doing this thing. But it's the same thing that you told me 10 years ago to do. Yeah. But now I just own that. Now I take responsibility for that. And I understand that if I connect with my body, I will be restoring the healthy lover or I will be um, living in my healthy king. Whereas before, could people, I, I said this to you in the last podcast, journaling for me is really difficult mm. but now I find myself desiring to get my thoughts down some way so I turn to journaling which before I was only doing it because somebody told me to do journaling sure. it made me feel better and it's the same thing but the context for me is different now mm. um, but yeah that if people are listening now and they're getting a little bit overwhelmed by this the principles the, the doing of it is 
quite simple and straightforward. You don't have to go and do a four day vision quest. You don't have to go and what were you saying earlier on you were <laughs> you're uh, fighting in Mexico and you've been climbing mountains and all sorts of stuff. You don't have to do that. The benefit we have is we can learn from you and gain from your experience. Mm. Uh, the stuff generally is relatively simple, mm. but gaining some awareness around one, the fact that you are feeling certain things and there's shadow in there, and two, there are things that you can do to control that, I mm. think is really empowering. Really, really empowering. Um, I shared this on another podcast, but um, maybe <laughs> listen, Jack, was it, uh, was it our, our chat today? The idea that um, traditionally when warriors went to war when they get home there'd be a purification ritual within the tribe which was about okay take off your armor bring your heart back online we need you back in the village now you've gone to war now it's time to like shift gears and we could consider if that was one thing people took from this podcast was okay I'm in my warrior during the day there's a lot of need to get things done there's like a certain amount of pressure but then when I land home, I don't want to be a warrior with my children. I want to be a lover and I want to be kind and compassionate and curious and all these things. So you might consider what's your purification ritual? How do you take off your armor when you get home? And a really simple one just coming to mind now is pick a song that you love, put it on in the car before you head in the car. And for the duration of that song, just do some deep breaths, five seconds in through your nose, five seconds out through your nose. Do that for three minutes and that's you shifting gears. And then maybe change your uniform when you get through the, the yeah. like change your environment a bit. Um, that might be a piece in terms of um, lover but uh, I guess just to round out our, our practical suggestions with lover um, something that brings you into your body so that's the benefit of breath work breath work makes us more aware of what's happening in our body that daily check in how do I feel what do I need uh, it can be really useful um, there's an exercise like inner child work is a, like, that's a podcast in itself yeah. but inner child inner child oftentimes ties into the the, the lover Um because it's our emotional body. Like as children, we're, we live through our bodies. Uh, like we live through the senses. We play in our, our bodies. We There's a lot of expression. And that kind of gets numbed out as we go through our heads over time. So a lot of our inner child stuff is related to lovers. So you could look into inner child work as well. Yeah. Um, so king, having a vision. Warrior, taking consistent action. You need your awareness of your values. So think about king and, 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 and warrior together. What are your values? And then practicing acting on those values every day. Uh, magician is about fear, taking a step back, taking a bit of space to breathe and to find perspective in your life. And then lover coming into the body, slowing things down, relating to your emotions in a more proactive way rather than numbing, just feeling what you feel and asking for feedback. What's this telling me? Beautiful. Cool. Pat. Before I did this podcast, I had a vision of, of what I wanted, what, what, how I would have liked it to go. Yeah. And I don't usually do that. Yeah. But with this, I know there's so many things we could speak about and I get really excited and go off on tangents. I want it to be very, very cohesive for people. I think you've done a cracking job there cool. because you've really helped me to even further narrow this down um, and, and recognize certain areas of myself. And it's, it's, I'm going to listen back to this a lot because the brief bit we did in base camp mm. just lit my fire again cool. and this has brought me even deeper so I'm sure listeners are the same cool. so first of all thank you very my much pleasure. for that I know if I know you have a course on this as well don't you do you have a course on yeah there's a course on my website called the masculine core uh, yeah my masculine core um, if anyone listens to this and wants a discount code message <laughs> me I'll give you 50% off oh, uh, and then I have a men's course starting in June called the Ma masculine leadership program so masculine leadership program.com that's a 10 week training online an in-person meetup at the end in Galway. So yeah, if, if it resonates. And if you just like want to scratch the surface with more of this stuff, the, there's two books, uh, King Warrior, Magician Lover. That's the original book on this stuff. And then there's a similar title. I think it's Warrior, Magician Lover, King or just a different um, order of the words by Rod Boothroyd, who's a friend of mine. That's a really good book worth checking out. And for the, for the females or anyone interested more in the female archetypes, Women Who Run With Wolves and anything by Caroline Miss. M Y S S. Okay. Yeah. And I don't not sure. Have you got more events coming up that they're all um, sold out and done? Almost done now. Yeah. For for the time being, okay. almost done. Yeah. Well, whenever Pat's next events come up, just let me know and thank you. I, I'll, I'll make sure to get them out there for people because really genuine. It was the first kind of that type of event I've been to, and I mean it's opened me up again. Cool. It's reintroduced me to a lot of this stuff that I'm ready for now at the moment. I feel really ready to kind of go a little bit deeper in this, whereas I didn't before. So again, thank you for that. And um, I do want to give one more little plug. You have just done another podcast with <laughs> with Andy in this very studio about two hours ago. So fair play. Pat's about four hours deep in the podcast now, so he's he's an absolute champ. Um, where he covered a lot of what you did in the base camp event that we didn't touch on today. So mm. um, if you want a little bit more context for those events and the, the great work Pat did, 
make sure you check out. It's This is going out on Tuesday. So if you listen to this now, Andy's episode's out in two days' time. Oh, cool. So, okay, great. So the week of Pat Dively going around, this <laughs> clip's going everywhere. Um, but thank you so much for your time, sir. It's an honor to call you a friend, to have you on the podcast. Um, I'm, I'm constantly learning and it's uh, just been <laughs> amazing. So, Likewise, man. You're getting better all the time at this. So thank you. You're a pro. Uh, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, yeah. Thanks, folks. We'll see you next time. Folks, thank you so much for listening to that episode. If you want to check out some of the best bits from previous episodes, just click right here.